There we go. Sorry about that, folks. Are we ready? Alex? Sorry about that. Uh, if you give us one second, I think okay. Council Member Silverstein is still coming in. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, I believe everyone's here and everyone should begin. Okay, great. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 25th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference through the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or sign up to speak on particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed. So please make sure to visit malibucity.org virtual forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom app if necessary. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. You must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please uh, raise your hand. I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. Can we have roll Paul, please. Councilmember Fair. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. I am finally here. Councilmember Hearing. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Here. Mayor Pearson. Here. Need the quorum. Okay, great. Um, we will now have the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Can I have a motion for the approval of the agenda. I so move. Um, and uh, Steve, yes. Uh, Mike, Mikey, yeah. Uh, last time with this, the, the two items, Paul Grisanti's resolution and the uh, transparency resolution that is on the end of the agenda, we agreed to read them both at the same time uh, because they're, in some places they conflict, in some places they get stuff that we may want to combine, and they agreed, we agreed to do that last meeting, I'd like to propose that again for this meeting. Okay. Yes, Paul? Do the minutes reflect that we agreed to do that? Yeah, the last meeting, Karen made the motion, I made the motion, Karen seconded. Did it get, did it get voted? Yes. Was it on that, Steve, or combining the uh, special meeting on homelessness? No, it was it was combining those two items, the Paul's item and the uh, transparency item below it. Could we ask for a clarification from the Please, city clerk? Yeah. What do you want clarification on? The minutes of the last meeting relative to combining my motion with Bruce's motion. I don't have them up in front of me, but I do recall that um, there was um, 
what's on the agenda tonight as 7C and 7D were to be heard concurrently and 7E and 7F were to be heard concurrently. That's my memory too. I remember yeah. both those items. Um, Do we want to include right. that in the motion tonight as well to hear those concurrently with each other? Oh, makes sense. What to, happened. Yeah. We, we voted on that at the last meeting, but we never got to them. Right. Right. Okay, so I think we need new motions. That seems fair. All yeah. right. So, um, Steve, you want to form a motion? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'd like to make a motion that we read, listen, we read and consider items seven D and seven F together. That's the Paul Grisanti and the transparency. Um, uh, Proposal, and do we want to do the? Uh, no, I'm seven E. Yeah, it's all changed. Seven E and F. I think you mean. We're using an old agenda. It's yeah, they're identical. It's easy to do. They're not. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, sorry, not agenda. The items. Yeah, it's E and F. Excuse me. You're right. It was E and F together. Okay. And do we want to do uh, the other one was Mikey's proposal for a separate homeless meeting and Bruce's proposal on dealing with the homeless issue. Combine those also. I so think it's smart so we can have one a little time. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm... I'd, I'd rather take them one at a time. Okay. Um, and I would say I would not be in favor of combining uh items seven e and f personally well let's let's see if there's a second on combining e and f because there is a motion do we have uh bruce you're you're on mute i will second okay so we have a to combine e and f we have a motion um can we have roll call on that motion please Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? No. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? No. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Do we have a motion on combining C and D again? Can I ask a question before we decide whether to make that motion? Which is how many public speakers have signed up for each of the two? Or which ones? C and D. C has seven and D has 15. So I'll make, I'll make a motion to combine them and I can explain that or do we have to wait for the second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So, Go ahead. so the, the, the reason I'm, I, I believe they should be combined is I, I actually think C is pretty simple and could probably go through the council pretty quickly, but we do have seven people signed up to speak. And my concern is by the time we get there, after we get through 7C, it's going to be too late to even get to 7D if we don't combine them. And more people have actually signed up to speak for it. If there had only been one or two people that wanted to speak for 7C, I'd say I'm perfectly fine with them being separate, but because they were together last time by motion, and because there is a lot to be discussed, apparently in the public eye at least, I would prefer they be combined. Okay. Um, there's a motion and, and a second. Can we have roll call, please? I'm sorry, who was the motion in second? Uh, <laughs> Bruce made the motion, I made the second. I did not hear that. Yeah. <laughs> there was some weird noise there. Yeah. It's like a munchkin. Uh, Bruce made the motion and Steve seconded it. Okay. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries, but we also, um, unless there was included in that a motion to approve the balance of the agenda. 
Okay, yes, let's let's make motion. a separate motion on that then. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the balance of the agenda, but John's got a question. Okay, I don't see John for some reason. Where are you? Oh, there you are, John. I can't hear you. Uh oh, something's gone all electronic on you. Sounds like you're on helium. <laughs> I'm not sure what's up. <laughs> Joys of Zoom. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but you turned into a munchkin. Um, I think okay. this happened to me once. Could John call in on his phone and talk as long as he's on screen? Uh, yeah. If, maybe if he has Zoom on his phone? Maybe he's dialing back. I'm not, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, Go uh, Yes, Bruce. Oh, wait, here comes John. Okay. I know he's near. There he is. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. All right, thank you. You've all addressed my questions so perfectly that I don't need to jump in anymore. But thank you for allowing me to fix my sound. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're good to move forward? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, Bruce. So I do have one further motion and I, 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 I don't mean to prolong this. The other motion is I believe that um, item 7D, which is now combined with 7C, was placed improperly on the agenda in the seven slot and it should be item 4C pursuant to city council resolutions. And I had a lengthy discussion with John earlier so as to not have to go through all the details during this meeting. And um, I also believe that as a matter of prudence, it ought to go before item seven in any event because there are so many members of the public who last week signed up to speak and who again this week have signed up to speak and it would be a real sin if as a result of going through the rest of the agenda before then, it became midnight and we never got to it. That's a hard one, I agree with you, but we have a lot of important issues. I think the, appeal, the appeals are, they've been waiting a long time too. I don't, I don't oh, have a good after the answer. Appeals. I, I meant 4C, it. after the appeals. The appeals are critically important to, to the residents. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, John, did you have a, a comment? Was there a comment that needs to be made on? on Mayor Pearson, members of the council, good evening. Um, Mr. Silverstein makes his, council member Silverstein makes his request based on uh, resolution number 98-083, which sets forth an ordering of the agenda. Uh, we did have a lengthy discussion and we have uh, kind of hashed out some ambiguity in section A with regard to format. Um, Mr. Silverstein's position, I, I, he's made it quite clear, is that as an ordinance, it belongs up in section, um, the section dealing with ordinances, I believe it's section seven, but before new business, um, placement of items on a city council meeting in the agenda is specifically says that individual council member agenda items shall be placed at the end of new business. So we did have that discussion today. And um, I think where we left it was, while there is some ambiguity, it's within the council's discretion to move his ordinance up if it's um, the council's pleasure. Um, yes, there is some ambiguity there, but I think um, it can be resolved by a vote of the council. I I agree. Um, okay, um, Paul. I'm uh, I'm I'm a little concerned that item D is uh, is. Well, are we talking? We're talking about C and D, or are we talking about E and F? Talking about item seven C, yeah. seven C, C and D. D then. Correct. Correct. There's now seven C and D. I. Uh, well, I guess I'll discuss it when we get to it then. Okay. I mean, I don't think there's much difference where it is now because council appointments, I think, go pretty quick. Yeah. I don't think that's okay. a long item. Um, Bruce? 
Yeah, so the, the, the reason I am asking that it go before the council appointments is I think they may not go as quick as they normally do, unfortunately. And again, I think it's very important to the community um, who've been expressing a lot of comments. I think I have over 100 written comments in support of 7D that we actually get to that tonight. Uh, well, let's have a motion then and see if there's a second. So the motion is that we place what is currently item 7D, which is also combined with 7C, in the 4C slot. Is there a second? The, re the reason I'm not going to second is I, I really think it should go to its own its own meeting because I think it's that big of an item. I really do. I mean, this is a huge, huge subject. And... Um, your item alone is huge. And then talking about the, which we've been, you know, talking about homeless in general and making plans is, is, is not easy and clearly, and, and, and people should care and I'm glad they care. I, I think we should let everyone know now that we're going to find a date. And I think we should find it now and do a night and spend a night on this and do it right. That would be how I feel. Well, that's, that goes to the merits of whether we're going to act on it after it's presented or not, that's not really the question of whether it gets presented. Steve? Uh, and, and Bruce, I think the homelessness issue is one of, is, is probably the main issue we've got in front of us in this upcoming year. Uh, I'm getting inundated with calls and emails on that subject. And I, I what I'm gonna suggest is if we don't get through it to it tonight in this current position, I'm going to recommend we continue this meeting to a later date this week and, and have the time to get make that, that may not pass, but I, I'd like to make sure we got plenty of time to go through that and we don't shortchange it when we, when we get to it. So that's where I am. Okay. Um, is there a second on the motion or, or not? Paul? Am, am I incorrect that there's still a motion on the floor uh, combining C and D? That, that already passed. Did we take the roll on that? Yes. Okay. Passed five to nothing. Good. All right. <laughs> well, welcome to the meeting. <laughs> um, I know, there's a lot going on. <laughs> okay. I, I don't, Bruce, I don't see a second on your motion at the moment. So can I have a, a motion to approve the rest of the agenda? I'll make a I motion. I still move. Oh, I'll second. Okay, can we have roll call on that, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No. Mayor Pro Tem Garcanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Um, I'd like to, I know it's late because luck went on, but I'd like to add one thing that we adjourn in memory of Kathy Sullivan, who is yeah. most of us know, you know, had a huge history with if Malibu at, at the library since I think 1994. Yeah. Um, and among many things, drove the bookmobile and other things, but also was on the task force that found a lot of a county money, um, which was kind of a big moment for us. So I'd like to add that to the, uh, that we join in, in her honor. Do you need a motion for that? Um, I need a second. I'll second. I'll second that. Okay. Um, second. I guess we need a roll call again. I apologize. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And I have a report on the posting of the agenda. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on January 14, 2021. Okay, thank you. Moving on, um, comments, uh, communications from the public. I know we have one or two. Um, we have 34 speakers. I'll read them in order. Bill okay. Sampson. Pamela conley Hewlett, Robert Brinkman, Dermot Stoker, Josh Spiegel, Daphne Anit, Tracy Stoker, Dana Gralick, Drew Leonard, 
Lloyd Ahern, Mark Bowdy, Doug Stewart, Barb Dicker, Joe Drummond, Chris Frost, Terry Davis, Julie Hoffman, Jeff Harris, Alexis Aria, Eberry Haldeman, Rosemary Eide, Joe Patterson, Hamish Patterson, Norman Haney, Lynn Norton, Hawk Wong, Scott Dietrich, Georgia Goldfarb, Craig Hill, Melanie Gosward, John Mazza, Howard Redsky, Julie Hoffman, I think she might be listed twice, and Ryan Embry. So first we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Okay, and as we get going, I just want to ask everybody, and I'll ask the city council too when I get to my comments. If it's, I know it's been a kind of a dramatic time and if we could all act with civility, I would be very appreciative tonight. Um, Can I just oh. ask one quick question, R really quick. Um, could the city manager please stay on screen during the public comment? Could I ask a question of a city attorney or a city clerk? Is that a requirement? Councilman Prefer, I'm not I'm not aware that that's a requirement. The Brown Act requires that you be on screen for purposes of determining a quorum. I don't know that it requires the city manager to stay on screen. If the council would like her to stay on screen, it can certainly ask her to. Do we I, need to take a vote on that? I guess you, I guess it can be a motion, but let's do it quickly because. Let's, we got lots to do. Do you have a motion? I, I move that it's discretionary. Where's Steve? Oh, yeah, where is Steve? Steve's on screen. Oh, there he is. He's right Jeez. here. Goodness. <laughs> um, I, I move that that's a discretionary choice on the part of the city manager. I'll second that. So before I, we vote, I'd just like to say when we sit on the dais, during live meetings, it's not discretionary on the part of anyone whether they sit up there or not. There's a space for each of us. And um, that's why I believe that it's inappropriate to be off camera during these meetings. Mayor, do you want to roll call? Um, sure, yes, thank you. Council Member Fair. I, I, I want to understand what I'm voting on. Your motion. Your motion. Okay, I was, was wanting to make sure. Okay, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No. Councilmember Yearing? No. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, move. Okay, can we have our public speakers, please? First, we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Okay. I answered. I hear I you, Bill. <laughs> oh. oh. Okay, video stop. Okay, I got a couple of things to say. Um, uh, one is regarding uh, some of the stuff on the camping ordinance, and I'd refer to it as that rather than homelessness. And I have no idea if what I have heard too much of is true or not. I hope it is not. What was said was that uh, Mayor Pearson has been working informally with a federal judge on this issue. My only comment is that would cause me great concern about the judicial officer. Uh, frankly, anything with a judge in my experience absolutely should be on the record in public. I don't know if it's true or not, so I'm not saying whether it is or is not. Um, if it is, uh, they sh the judicial officer ought to cut it off and I would urge the mayor to cut it off regardless because it ought to be on the record. Uh, next, speaking of judges, uh, like a lot of people, I've now been notified that the city manager is a uh, threatening suit of the city. I am absolutely against the city giving her a three-eighths of a million dollar paid vacation for a year. She is a CEO. That's a tough position, no matter where you are. She objects to being scrutinized. She should have been scrutinized for years. She is now being scrutinized tough. It's a hard job. If, if she's not up to it, take a resignation. That's just fine. I would just soon be rid of her. 
because of her position on the short-term rentals and what she did to our neighborhood with the connivance of some of the council members, but she ought to be gone if she wants to be. Right now, it's a real problem having her here, threatening Ms. Suis, threatening to leave and complaining. Uh, I don't know of a win-win on it. I assume you've turned it over to the insurance carriers and to employment lawyers. Probably, I would suggest it probably should be somebody other than someone at Best Best and Krieger. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I am outraged she wants to take my money for a paid vacation. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next is Pamela Conley Ulick. Okay. Hi, good evening, uh, council members and Mayor Pearson. Hi, uh, this is Pamela Conley Ulick, and I just want to take a moment to uh, thank you for honoring Kathy Sullivan with. Uh, to adjourn in her honor. And I'm here to just uh, kind of remind you at the end of the day, life and death, you know, it's quick. Before we know it, we could not be here. And I'm hopeful that at the end of the day, we all remember the dash that we're living is the dash how we treat each other. And I'm hoping and praying that our community can be a an example of how we can agree to disagree civilly. We can move forward together. Both sides, no matter where you're sitting, love Malibu. And I'd really hope and pray that today, going forward, everyone sitting, everyone in the Zoom room with your camera on can agree that everyone who's speaking to you and everyone who's sitting in the Zoom room with you, we all love Malibu and we all wanna make it better for everyone. So let's just start with that. Start with that we're all on the same side. And um, I wanna thank, I, I, was, uh, I was honored to be included in the community, community emergency response team meeting this weekend. And it was so beautiful to see those people who give of themselves to help our community and I'm hoping um, that more people were, are going to step up because it's going to take all of us working together. And um, one of the things that came out is March 28th is going to be here around the corner too. And that's the city of Malibu's birthday. And we're going to be 30 years old, but like democracy, it's an experiment. And we may not be here. We may not make it another year or two or 30 years, but I hope we can take a moment to reflect the last 30 years and what we've done. And when I served um, for our 16th birthday, we did we did a beautiful community mural at, at uh, if everyone can go up to Bluffs Park and the Michael Landon Center, I would urge you. And um, CERT might have an opportunity with some containers to do some community art or other art to commemorate our 30th birthday. But I'm hoping that there's some project that everyone can work on that can remind us of why we live here in Malibu and that we are neighbors, that we are all here to help each other. And we, even if we don't agree on everything, let's just try and remember one day you may need my help or I may need yours. So I just am begging, I've been reading so much hatred and there's no place for hate here in Malibu. Let's just start to love each other again. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. We'll hear from Robert Brinkman. Hello? I can hear you, Robert. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, I'm a uh, uh, resident of uh, Malibu Park. Uh, I would like to ask the council to look into the planning commission policies and enforcing the code uh, in Malibu. I have a problem. Uh, my house, which burned down in the Wolfie fire, uh, is being rebuilt. And the lot next to me, which was the residence of Mr. Spina, who'd been there for a long time, was sold to somebody who's coming in and also wanting to rebuild. But he came in with uh, bigger ideas than could be accomplished on that lot. He wanted to build a two-story house that blocked most of my ocean views. And because I didn't support him in that uh, effort with the city, got mad at me 
and he's now uh, been approved for single story residence that's 10 feet in height. But on my side of the property, there's an 18 foot poured in place concrete wall. So it's a wall that extends way above his house. Um, and it's there to spite me and block my view because I had a problem with him building a two story structure, uh, which the city wouldn't have approved anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, he was hoping I would help him get approved. I've discussed this with uh, Mr. Mollica, who was sympathetic and agreed with me that this was a spite wall. Um, but because the wall is attached to the main structure of the house, it doesn't count as such. Um, and Mr. Mollica told me that there was, in fact, another wall like that, where an 18 foot wall extends out to the side of a house uh, on Point Doom. And he said that this wall also was approved because it connects to the main structure of the house. And so his argument for letting this approval stand was that they have to enforce the code uniformly. In other words, because somebody else uh, got away with building an 18 foot wall that because it touches the house doesn't count as a wall, but counts as a structure, he would also have to approve this wall, which in this, in my case, extends up away from the structure to block my view. And um, I tried to appeal to him and say that this is not uh, enforcing uh, the spirit of the law, even if it is within the letter of the law. But again, his argument was that they have to um, do this uniformly. And because essentially one bad decision had been made, more des bad decisions have to be made. And I'd like the council to look into that and uh, see if there's something that can be done about the enforcement of these rules. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> We'll hear from Dermot Stouffer. There you go. Are you there? I can hear you, Dermot. Oh, hi. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to begin by thanking the Building and Safety Department, the Planning Department, the City staff, and the inspectors that helped us get through a recent home improvement project. Everyone was extremely helpful, courteous, and professional. My thanks absolutely include our valiant and outstanding city manager, who has endured vicious attacks over these many months by individuals who have probably never held the title of city manager or experienced the extreme pressure of such a position or managed any city hall and its many professional employees. I imagine those that have chosen to attack her may have never met her or even taken the time to sit with her to discuss any grievances. Reva Feldman has been accessible and completely for professional as city manager. Reva works tirelessly for the citizens of Malibu, and she earns every penny by her steadfast loyalty and commitment to us all. The relationships she has formed with many other municipalities and state government officials is outstanding. They include the federal government, LA County Health Department, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, state beaches and harbors, and the California Coastal Commission. Those agencies represent a very short list of offices the City of Malibu has been working with and counts on to move forward. It's easy to sit back and bash everything and anyone you may not agree with. No one who has been critical of her performance could step up, step up and fill her shoes and run this city with such clarity and resolve. The majority of residents that voted for Bruce Silverstein must be appalled by his behavior. This may be the way things are in Delaware, but it's unacceptable here in Malibu. You may have skipped that chapter on how to behave like a gentleman, but I suggest you seek counsel on how to operate in this town. The golden rule comes to mind. It's pretty basic and quite easy to understand. In the meantime, Bruce, there are an abundance of very talented therapists in Malibu. I highly recommend you seek treatment for your unhappiness is quite visible. We will all benefit from your voluntary compliance. To all the residents that voted for Bruce, I would suggest commencing a recall vote. There must be many of you that wish they could change their vote. Hopefully, someone with enough gumption will start the process and get the signatures required to remove Bruce. But one thing is guaranteed. Your brief term in office will be very difficult time for you if you continue to behave poorly. 
I thank the remainder of the council for their time and dedication to the residents of this beautiful community. Your effort is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Dermot. Next, we'll hear from Josh Spiegel. Hi there, can you hear me? I can hear you, Josh. Hey, thanks, Dermot. I appreciate you. Uh, good evening, Council. Thanks for donating your time to the town. My name is Josh Spiegel, and I felt compelled to speak tonight about how horribly we've treated Reva. There are many people who disapprove of her job performance, but that does not give us the right to harass, threaten, and insult someone into submission. Every one of us should take a moment and look ourselves in the mirror and ask if we like what we see. The people who believe what Bruce did to Reva was justified should be ashamed of themselves. The ends do not justify the means. Reva, I'm so sorry you're going through this. As a community, we need to do better. I won't take up any more of your time in the hopes that the council can get through at least one meaningful agenda item this time. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Next, we'll hear from Daphne and Good evening, Mayor and members of the, the City Council. Uh, my name is Daphne Anate. I've lived in Malibu since 1994. I'm a single mom, uh, having raised two girls. Uh, who go to school here in Malibu. I still have a daughter who is a junior. And I have recently been honored to be appointed to the Public Safety Commission by Council Member Silverstein. And when he spoke with me about the commission, we, we talked about how we may have some differing views and different approaches on things. Uh, unfortunately, I, I really didn't foresee how how deep some of our differences could be. As a female working professional, I feel compelled to speak out against the way uh, our city manager has been treated. I'm a practicing attorney. I spend my life working with city managers, elected officials, and people who have dedicated their lives to public service all over the state. People who go into public service go into public service with a good heart, a hard, worth ethic, a hard work ethic, and a desire to actually bring benefits to the communities in which they serve. In Malibu, there is a form of government in which the city council is the leading body and has a city manager who reports to it. I have been looking at all of the reports and all of the complaints about our city manager, but frankly, if we have an issue with how the city is being run, we need to look to our elected officials and the direction that they're giving to our city manager. To make the city manager the target is unacceptable. To call her a witch, a rat, a fascist, surely we are better than this. I also saw recently that she has been driven to offer to tender her resignation, and that in turn has precipitated a whole other series of insults and indignities towards our city manager. I can tell you that the offer that Ms. Feldman has put out there is more than reasonable. City managers enter into contracts that allow the city council to buy them out if there's a change in government, a change in power, a change in desire, and, and the council wants a change of leadership. That's what Ms. Feldman has offered the city. I don't have enough personal knowledge to really be able to, to judge whether all these accusations have any merit or not, but the way they're being, the way they're being put out there, the way that she has been mistreated and disrespected, her city must be better than this. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Next, we'll hear from Tracy Stoker. Are you there, Tracy? Uh, 
Are you there, Tracy? Tracy won't be speaking. Okay. Thank you, Dara. Next, we'll hear from Dana Grelick. Good evening, City Council members, and thank you and City staff for your service. After the last city council meeting, it's clear that the community expects a more civil interaction from those representing us. Hamish called out the dehumanization that was taking place, and I agree. The behavior displayed on all sides was not representative of our city, and I ask the following of our city council. I would like to know what steps the city is taking to investigate Reva Feldman's complaints of a hostile work environment. As an employer, I know that when such claims are made, it must be investigated and dealt with swiftly and by an independent entity. Can you please share with us how the city is handling that? It's clear that we will be looking for a replacement for our city manager, and I hope that steps are being taken to secure a safe work environment for our city staff. I'm terribly concerned about our ability to attract a qualified and competent city manager whilst our current culture is one marred by bullying and harassment all while in a time of COVID, fire rebuilds, wildfire threat, homelessness, the list goes on and on. Not the most appealing want ad. Second, I ask that you focus on what benefits the city of Malibu, and that means efficiently working through the agenda. There's a budget that needs to be approved so that the city processes can keep rolling. I caution you that pulling cogs out of the machinery, either by force or by consequences of a hostile culture, are going to cause everything to fall apart. Your community needs inspectors to show up for their rebuilds. We need parks and rec staff trying to figure out ways to engage and support our children while they're struggling through a pandemic. And we need our city hall to function. Please remember your duties to the community. And that means to work together to enact legislation, approve city programs, adopt the city budget and approve funds necessary to provide service to the city's residents, business and visitors. Thank you all again for your service and commitment to our city. Thank you, Dan. Next, we'll hear from Drew Leonard. Hello, City Council. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, I just want to say that Daphne basically said it all for me. Um, I just feel really, really disappointed in regards to how a city staff employees job performance has been taken away uh, from the city council and basically a decision has been made by a group of political activists that are not even involved in any of the committees or any of the aspects of the city. And um, I just think it's really, really sad and I'm very disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Next, we'll hear from Lloyd Ahern. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Lloyd. Okay, thanks. This is Lloyd Ahern. Um, on January 11th, I witnessed the most electrifying display of political malpractice I've seen in a long time. That night, Bruce took over 20 minutes to talk about the agenda, which usually takes less than two minutes. It's a little contagious because it almost happened again tonight. He then took up massive amounts of time on ticky tock items and then had the nerve, the nerve to complain his number seven item would not be heard. It's like the Menendez brothers after they killed their parents and the judge is sentencing them to life in prison. They say, we want mercy. He says, well, he says, why? He says, well, because we're orphans, you know? Well, Bruce, you talked all night. The Menendez brothers killed their parents. You deserve whatever you get. And you may not get to your thing again tonight because you're gonna, I, I guarantee you, you're gonna talk. You're gonna talk yourself right out of a job. To say that Bruce is out of touch with reality is a massive underestimate, uh, under, understatement. Bruce, when you were 16 years old, some young lady must have dumped you and you never recovered and you're still getting revenge. There's an old proverb, he who seeks revenge digs two graves and the grave you're digging is called recall good night thank you lloyd next we'll hear from mark bowdy hello can you hear me 
I can hear you, Mark. Great. So I'll echo a few comments. The, the last meeting was, it was not just disappointing. It, it actually was an embarrassment to the city of Malibu. And Lloyd's correct. This meeting started off as more of the same. And there's really, there's really only two people at fault for that so far and for nothing getting done. It's the two rookie councilmen, Steve Uring and Bruce Silver Trump. You guys, you've never done this. You have no experience. You're waste. Your two opening proposals and the way you have presented them to this council show all of us that you know nothing about how to work as a team. You, it's very clear that your game plan is Trumpian. You're going to use social media. You're going to shout. You're going to abuse people. You're going to mistreat people. It doesn't work in any city in California. It will not work in Malibu. Nobody in Malibu needs to pretend that Malibu is special. Of course, we all love it. It doesn't work anywhere. And you guys will not be able to pass poorly written proposals like the two proposals you've submitted because you shout at people or you use social media. You are completely out of touch with reality. You have submitted a modification to a no camping ordinance that is a joke. It's poorly drafted. It's poorly conceived. Anybody looking at it who is debating whether to sue the city of Malibu during the year when a regional housing needs assessment needs to be completed will know that you have made the city a ripe target. Two outside investigations need to be done right now. Reva Feldman and Bruce Silvertrump have each filed HR complaints. Reva feels abused, intimidated, and threatened. And I've read Bruce's complaint. Bruce's complaint is so verbose and laden with psychosis that he should withdraw it, but I don't think he's smart enough to withdraw it. Those two investigations, those two complaints need to be investigated by an outside law firm, Asta Pronto, so that Riva feels safe. Bruce does not hide his motives. His campaign promise was, I'll get rid of Riva Feldman, but he doesn't have the votes to do that. So what he's decided to do is abuse her. We only have right now two female leaders, Karen Ferrer, Riva Feldman. We want to keep both of them. Riva is not going to quit in the short term. All of you who say we've lost her, don't give up. Riva, don't give Bruce Silver Trump the satisfaction of quitting. Second, outside investigation. Not by Bruce Silver Trump. That's a joke. He can't investigate anything, and he lied to you. Bruce is a lawyer who will lie to the city council Mark. to get certain of his campaign promises fulfilled. Mark, that's your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll hear from Doug Stewart. Good evening, council members. I want to speak to you tonight about a very disappointing last five to 10 weeks in the life of our city. This was stated well in the city manager's letter describing the hostile work environment and harassment at the hands of new council member Silverstein. We know the facts in that letter are true as it's been a disaster played out on the wide screen by his public statements and flooded social media posts. Who would have known that the candidate in August who asked his fellow competitors to run their campaigns without negativity in the spirit of a better Malibu would revert to his prior habits to cause his old law firm in Delaware to have to settle out of court a few months before he left the firm in 2017, a $13.6 million lawsuit he caused. What we have here is a city council member who is using his unique position as an elected official to single-handedly stop the operation of our city government. Just as a police officer cannot use the badge and color of authority to arbitrarily harass, threaten, or harm people, a council member has to work with the other members of the council to build a consensus of the majority. A minority of one does not have the right to cause this level of harm. Now, let me compare what is happening to what my experience is as a corporate executive and member of several corporate boards. And I compare a corporate board to the city council as you have the same duty to advise, consent, and direct. In California, every person that works in a middle to larger size corporation or operation has to take regular training on how to avoid and deal with harassment and discrimination of all types. 
for a corporate board to see what is occurring these last few weeks is an immediate call to action to proactively stop the damage as well as to initiate corrective action. I know this has been referred to as an insurance matter and, and someone else is taking care of it off the city staff, but I believe there's a duty to immediately investigate what other events have taken place beyond those stated in the city manager's letter. Why you ask? Because you have to ensure to the rest of the staff and future employees that this is not to be tolerated at all and we'll deal with it proactively. Not to mention you want to stop and repair the damage to the city's operations that have been caused in these last few weeks. In the corporate world, there would be an immediate separation of the parties so that the damage would be stopped. Oftentimes you would suspend the offender, but then again, you can't suspend an elected official. Then a special investigation would be undertaken. While this would usually be done by an HR department, in cases such as senior executives or board members, you have to go to an outside competent investigator such as a law firm to promptly deal with the problem and execute corrective action. The basis for such action is the same as when the allegations of corruption at City Hall were presented on December 14th. As one council member said, if you know something, bring it forward and we will investigate. Well, here you have probable violations of the California Employment and Fair Housing Acts, as well as federal civil rights and anti-discrimination laws. For likely the first time in Malibu's history, we may have a sitting council member who knowingly, materially, and publicly violated state and federal laws. Thank you. Thank you, Di. Next, we'll hear from Barb Decker. Are you there, Barb? Barb, can you hear me? I don't actually know if she's in the meeting, so we'll check that. Okay, later. we can cycle back in. Yeah. Next, we'll hear from Joe German. Hi, Honorable Mayor Mikey and City Council members. Hi, Joe. Happy New Year. I hope this year can be better than our last few years here with the fires and pandemic in Malibu. So I am speaking to implore all of you council members to please think about the greater good of Malibu and the voting public and to get along and agree on things during these city council meetings, despite your personal feelings. Personal feelings for other council members should be left out of our city government. I appreciate that the meeting started on this tone and I hope we can continue this way. I think it's disgusting tonight how community members have demonized certain elected city council members, especially one who received the most votes in Malibu. I believe this all started with the judgmental decision of not allowing Bruce Silverstein to be mayor pro tema again after a majority of the public voted him into office. This is something that won't be forgotten in the next election in two years, so I implore you all to set aside your differences in these meetings and work together for the good of our city. Our congressional leaders apparently don't like each other very much, but do somehow manage to find common ground and identify shared goals and work to achieve them. You were all voted in by us for good reason, and we hope you can make a difference and follow the vision and mission, mission statement in Malibu in all of our, your actions. With regards to our city manager, Reva Feldman, and the outpouring of support for her, I appreciate her right to resign, and she must have good reason. We appreciate all that you all sacrifice and do for our city and our community of Big Rock. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next, we'll hear from Chris Frost. Good evening, Mayor Pearson, council Chris. members, and staff. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. Good, thank you. I'm Chris Frost, Chair of the Malibu Public Safety Commission, speaking as a resident as well. I have worked with everyone on the council except Bruce. I have found all of them to be congenial, receptive, and willing to do the heavy lifting required to get things done. I have worked with just about every staff member of this city over the last 18 years and found all of them to be receptive and helpful. New council member Uring and I have spoke, spoken on a number of occasions about a number of different safety issues, and he and I have always seemed to find common ground and better yet, the ability to listen to each other's ideas. And it took little or no effort. This method needs to be incorporated into the agendas of everyone representing this city. Otherwise, we will have more wasted time and little accomplished. Because of the log jam, we are behind on the budget hearing and not able to follow through on decisions and implement measures 
that are vital to our city's safety. The Public Safety Commission has a robust agenda whose recommendations often end up as budgetary items. We were hoping to have the budget done by tonight so as to help us toward a safer city. Safety issues brought to light by council members and staff need to be vetted through the Public Safety Commission for recommendations to be given to the City Council. Safety issues need to go to the Public Safety Commission first to give a voice to those recommendations, as well as any suggestions, objections, and otherwise important opinion on how we police safety in our city. It should never be pushed directly onto the council agenda without commission oversight. Due to the divisiveness and anger that has thus far been exhibited, the city of Malibu is operating at about half of its capability. Lost in all of that have been the contributions made by council members, public safety, public works, compliance, building and safety, and the city staff who run the city on a day-to-day -day basis. Their hard work is what keeps us on the rails. Besides slowing much of the city business to a crawl, Bruce, you have been in that seat less than two months and have already caused the city to have to lawyer up. We have the homeless issues, parking issues, street racing, speed, generally unsafe behavior on PCH and our Canyon roads. We are constantly under the threat of fire, weather, and the influx of visitors. We have a pandemic and its economic fallout Yet through the cooperation of city staff, city council, and city commissions, we look to find avenues of success in our endeavors to successfully complete these and other challenges within our city. This is a team sport, ladies and gentlemen. This will only be successful if we all find a way to work together. Please, let's get down to the business of running the city and not running a personal agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next, we'll hear from Terry Davis. Good evening. At the risk of being repetitious, can you hear me? I can hear you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, City Managers, City Manager and City Staff. I am both disheartened and dismayed by the announcement that City Manager Reva Feldman has offered to leave her position as City Manager. Earlier, I sent this communication to City Council and referred to Reva's, quote, tendering your net resignation. I misspoke, but for me, it was the same. The national tactics we have seen these last four years and that have been not only overlooked, but encouraged, bullying, slander, lies, violence. Sorry. There we go. Was that you, Mikey? <laughs> Shall I continue? Sorry, Jay, was, that was my mother-in-law on the voice, on the, on the landline <laughs> leaving a message and no one's used that phone in about two weeks, sorry. Uh, God bless her. <laughs> okay, getting back. Uh, what was I saying? Where was I? Okay, the national tactics we have seen these last four years and that have not only been overlooked, but encouraged, bullying, slander, lies, violence, they are divisive, they are destructive, and they are demeaning. Using any of these tactics, pushing our city manager into a corner, forcing her to choose between spending precious city time to defend herself or for the sake of the city and her own quality of health and life to move on is, I believe, not only unnecessary, but unconscionable. Tactics we should not tolerate. I am disheartened by the mirroring of this division, distrust, accusations, harassment, blame, and to quote our new president, the uncivil war that exists across our nation in the microcosm that is the city of Malibu. I am dismayed because I thought we were better. No one is perfect. People make mistakes. Challenge is healthy. It forces us to seek the deeper truths. It makes us stronger and hopefully wiser. Admitting our mistakes and learning from them makes us better people. We are in the midst of a world pandemic. We are quickly reaching an unimaginable milestone, 500,000 deaths from COVID. We still have scores of people out of their burned homes and those experience, experiencing homelessness is growing exponentially. As I said, challenge is healthy. 
If there has been any wrongdoing in the city, it needs to be found and addressed in a civil and respectful way. Tearing the city apart, dividing the city and its residents serves no one. I expect and challenge the city, the council, the staff to grow up, act like reasonable and respectful adults who can disagree and seek conclusions. I hope that in that environment, Riva will rethink her willingness to leave and council and staff will find a way to work together. I am fairly new to Malibu. I've been here less than 10 years, but I think that Terry, my community- that's your time. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Mm, we had a Julie Hoffman signed up, but she doesn't appear to be in the meeting. Um, so we'll come, we'll come back to that. Uh, Jeff Harris would be next. He doesn't seem to be responding. Oh, I see him there now. Is. Are you there, Jeff? Good evening, uh, Mayor and I City Council you. and staff and uh, City Manager. Um, many people have said this better than I can, but um, I too was appalled at the meeting last he week. Uh, am I? Am I here? Yes, yeah. you're here, Jeff. I can hear you. Good evening. Um, Mayor and City Council and staff. And, um, Sounds like and, you have your TV on. Um, yep. Many people have said this better than I can, but um, I too was appalled at the meeting last week. And the, um, I, yeah, turn I, down your turn down your TV. Yeah. Okay. Down. Sorry, I'll I'll. Sounds like you have your TV on. Um, Many people have said Oh, yeah, yeah, let's turn that off, honey. I'm sorry. Okay, okay my mother-in-law called, too, so it's one of those. Sorry for that uh, disruption. No um, I've been here since 1976 and worked among others to create the city. And we chose a city to be able to interact, uh, face problems, protect the environment, protect our citizens, and really be able to interact on a uh, cordial and responsible way that we would not be able to do if LA County still uh, had jurisdiction over us. You know, we have many issues on our plates and I've been appalled at how the uh, one council person has uh, paralyzed in many respects, the inner workings of the city as Chris Voss and others have mentioned. We're trying to get vaccine to the city right now. We're trying to uh, figure out how to endorse mass mandates and social distancing. Uh, we're trying to get rebuilds for people who tragically lost their homes. And yet I know of one individual up on Upper Horizon who still doesn't have electricity from Edison. Um, there's lots of real problems out there that the city and its staff need to uh, tackle along with all the volunteers on the commissions that are, have done such a good job. We, I, for one, just cannot tolerate any more of the time spent, um, you know, on Bruce. And, you know, we've already spent probably a good hour today. Um, and uh, he must become cordial he must become um, responsible and reasonable if we're going to um, have a city that can operate again like it has in the past. Um, I don't, you know, this has uh, been very upsetting to see his behavior and his treatment of Riva, and I agree that there should be independent councils investigating um, all the hostile environment issues and the issues that Bruce has brought up and um, and that this should not be um, 
taking up city businesses that should be done tonight and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next in the list is Alexis Aria, but I don't see her in the meeting. So we'll come back to her. Okay. And next we'll hear from E. Barry Helpman. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Barry. Okay, thank you. Um, I've uh, lived in Malibu as long as it's been a city and I've never seen the city in such disarray as I've seen since the last election. What has been introduced by certain city council members has been accusations of fraud, bribery, dishonesty, and very little hard facts to back that up. And as I understand, council uh, Councilperson Silverstein has already made two complaints to the State Bar Association about our current city attorney and his firm. And as a practicing attorney, I can tell you that's serious to any legal career. There has been an extremely disruptive atmosphere created in the city hall, primarily caused by one council person. Result, we now have an allegation of a hostile workplace and other charges threatened against the city something I and other speakers predicted at the last meeting. Uh, that means additional city attorney legal fees. It means bringing in an insurance company that could, if they paid out, cause a potential increase in insurance premiums to the city. The possibility that if this hostile workplace is felt by, city, by the city manager, it could be felt by others in the city who would make similar claims and potentially leave. This in turn will leave the city vulnerable until staff positions and the city manager positions are filled. But who will want to work for a city with such rampant hostility that is apparent from certain members of the city council on social media and their contact even after being elected? And look at the cost. In addition to additional legal fees and possible higher insurance premiums, the city runs the risk of paying out uh, Riva's contract at $375,000 that's the cost of one and a half additional police cars. I absolutely appreciate the need for full public disclosure as much as is reasonably possible, but there is a way to accomplish that without demands, threats, claims of wrongdoing and accusations. And I find it curious that the ire has been focused on women, first Christy Hogan and now Reva Feldman. So what I recommend is there be an investigation by an outside labor firm to determine whether the practices within the city, especially since the election, have violated any labor laws, created issues that will damage the city, and who instruct all of the council and staff on the proper way to act in the workplace. Our city begs for healing and unity. Bullying is not the answer. We need our council to lead the way and represent the best in all of us. I ask that the council members set an example for our community and our children as to how we should act and how to solve problems. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Next on the list is Rosemary Eide, but I don't see her in the meeting either. Okay. So next we'll hear from Joe Patterson. Okay. You there, Joe? Yeah. Okay, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, council, staff, city manager. Um, I wanted to speak tonight on a few different issues. Uh, the first of which is, um, you know, my concern of the, you know, the recent things that have transpired, you know, what appears to be a threat of litigation by our current city manager I question whether the current city manager will be placed on an administrative leave while the city is able to determine the best course of action in dealing with this threat. Seems to me that if a city employee whom is dissatisfied with the current work environment to the point they have retained legal counsel and are threat threatening litigation, for that employee to continue to work in that environment in what they perceive to be toxic or untenable is only asking for further potential liability or damage to the city. Number two, uh, this is regarding the given uh, the numerous small suspicious fires that we've seen occur within our city over the past several weeks. 
I asked the council to inform the public as to what, if any, investigations into the cause of these fires is taking place by and by what agencies. Does the council or the city have any information to share with the public as to the origin or the possible origin of these fires? What is the council or city doing or planning to do to prevent such fires in the future? What information is available to council from or the city from LA County Fire or the LA County Sheriff's that can be shared with the public in regards to these and other fires within our city limits, which have already been handled by LA County Fire and or the sheriffs and that the general public may not be aware of. I feel the answer to these questions are of great importance to the safety and well being of the Malibu residents. Then on the subject of transparency, we want it and we want it now. Stop the BS ordinances and the workarounds and give the residents and the council members we elected access to the information that they, they and we are requesting. Adopt the policy described in item 7F. And finally, on the illegal camping on PCH, you made a good start with restricted parking hours on PCH. It has reduced the number of RVs, campers, and vans illegally camping on PCH immeasurably and literally overnight. Good job. Don't stop there. I implore you to give serious consideration to Mr. Uring and Mr. Silverstein's proposed item 7D to amend the current Malibu Municipal Code 9.08.90, which in current form has been deemed unenforceable. Please consider this amendment in order to allow this code, which has been on the books and adopted by the city for nearly two decades, to be legally and vigorously enforced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Next, we'll hear from Hamish Patterson. Good evening, Council. Hey, Hamish. Hey, good evening. Um, wow, another long night, everybody. Um, I, I really just wanted to chime in, and this is more so for the, the public. Again, I've, I've heard people claiming they're holding the higher ground by taking the lower route. Once again, and it, it disappoints me is, is you want the name calling to stop by calling names. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It, and I, I want to remind everyone in the public too, this is a, a nonpartisan body. This is, this is the point of our city council is to be nonpartisan. We have nonpartisan representation for a reason. And I also really want to point out that our city council represents us. So anything that's going on in the city council is a reflection of us as a community as a whole. And I suggest that our community take a deep look at itself. It's said that the outside world is a reflection of our inner selves. And after what we've been through as a nation the last year, recently, Everyone needs to take responsibility for themselves on a spiritual, emotional, and public level. I, I like the fact that people have showed up for the last couple meetings, but I will also say that as an active member of the public process, very few people participate. And it seems like everybody's come out now to, to prove a point, but most people hide behind social media, and chat rooms and community forums because there's no skin in the game. And I don't know what that's all about, but again, it's, it's easy to point fingers at, at the council members or, the, or the, at the people in the government, but these are our people. They represent us. So we have to take responsibility for ourselves and take a deep look in the mirror Apparently, Malibu is not immune to what is going on. The, the vile discourse is here in this community. It's a Malibu way of life. It says so on the bumper stickers or the license plate frames. Hmm, maybe we need to take a deeper look at ourselves as people. And with that said, I'm about building things. I'm about building a skate park. I started this process 10, 10 years ago. And everybody up on that city council, everybody up in that city government, everybody in the community can make something beautiful for the children, for the next generation. Let's focus on building something in our community. And again, I suggest that our city government have a public forum where we can all come together and look at each other 
10 feet apart in the eye and realize who our neighbors are and who our community is. Hamish, that's yes. right. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Next we'll hear from Norman Haney. Uh, good evening, uh, city council members, and thank you for your service. Um, I'm not exactly sure why somebody would want the kind of uh, job that you have. Uh, you spend a great deal of time, and uh, your families uh, also um, are participating uh, by taking uh, by taking by losing you uh, during that time. Um, I want to start out by saying that I, I have a great deal of respect for Richard Mullica and all of the staff members. Uh, they work very hard. Uh, Richard uh, is currently the director, and I think, uh, I think he has done a great job in the past, and he will do a great job in the future. And I'm very happy uh, that he took uh, Bonnie's uh, position. Um, my concern is um, how quickly the proposed hotel uh, is, is moving uh, through the process. Um, the, um, I was told that, that, the, that the project needed an a, um, initial study, which was supposed to take six, six to eight weeks it actually took longer than that. And then uh, it was, uh, then the staff of the city was supposed to review it and have their review done in 30 days. <clears throat> that was uh, two months ago. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the delay is. <clears throat> I understand that the environmental review uh, is supposed to do just that look at the options and make a determination as to what the environmental impact will be for this project given the current uses. <clears throat> well, let's look at that. The current uses um, have more traffic, more points of ingress and egress from PCH, which makes PCH unsafe. Um, the traffic makes it more congested more pollution, the hotel will reduce that traffic. Um, if you go through all of the issues, visual impact, the current use of the property, and for the last 15 years, has been a visual blight on the most traveled uh, scenic highway in the entire city the hotel will eliminate that. And its setback won't be 20 feet, 30 feet. It's 46 feet from PCH. And the no, first 24... That's, that's your time. All right. That, um, I need to learn how to speak faster, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norm. Next, we'll hear from Lynn Norton. Good evening, council members. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Lynn. Um, for context, I just want to say that I have never publicly or privately said that I thought Reba should be fired. I have never made those statements. I have never come to that conclusion. And I don't like public accusations being made. To me, I like a process of discovery and revealing evidence, and that's it. But I just wanted to say that I was shocked by some of Reva's letter that she wrote to the city. And specifically this, um, Reva's making a complaint that includes the fact that Bruce makes innuendos about her that could harm her professional res reputation. And then I was floored when I saw an innuendo in her um, paper about Jefferson Wagner, which said that while Reva, quote, maintained professional relations with Mr. Wagner while he served on the city council, it was well known that Mr. Wagner possesses and stores multiple weapons in his house. It's like innuendo that he's some kind of a physical threat to her, which I thought was magnitudes more than any innuendo I've ever heard about Reva. 
So that bothered me. Um, on another note, I just um, I am a very big fan of the Public Records Act, and um, I think it's essential for citizens to in essentially investigate their government. I've used that a lot of times myself for different things. And when you investigate, you might find out that something is wrong, and you might find out that everything's done properly, but it's a, it's a good process. And when it comes to the city council, there are things that only you, the five of you, can oversee in the city because not everything is accessible to the public through the Public Records Act. And specifically, right now, I'm thinking about any phone records that belong to the city that I know that Bruce a month, or at the last meeting had asked for, and I can't think of any good reason why all the city council members wouldn't have access to any phone records that are associated with the city. Um, it just doesn't make any sense that anything would be totally out of the public eye so much that even the council members couldn't see it. So I'm just asking you to make sure that Bruce gets the whatever phone records that he wants. And on a final note, I just want to say, please help Norm get that project done. <laughs> OK? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. I just want to hear from Hawk Wong. Can you hear me? I can hear you. OK, yes. yeah. yeah, my name is Hawk Wong. <laughs> I just want to give it my opinion, that's all. I mean, you know, I've been living here for close 25 years. I think that, well, it is a big relief, some relief for me that I found out somebody is taking responsibility to make the city more transparent, okay? Because making someone public servant, you all you guys are public servant, accountable for every action you make, okay? Let's make a difference because I'm an MD, okay? I have plenty of things to do. I don't really deal with city policy, a polit a politics, until a few years back, okay? Uh, something aside, regarding the COVID vaccine, you know, this, the distribution of vaccine had to so came from very top before, okay? Now we just change. Before, from a very, very top of the country, okay? When it trickled down to the city level, you don't have much power. A special Malibu. Malibu is in a high risk area. They don't give you the vaccine. You don't, you don't have no choice to get it. So I think you have no choice about it. But I think it's, I hope things are going to get better. But anyway, when we go back to my dealing with the city, only started a few years back. I, maybe it's a, that's a me. I, I get a totally different perspective. I mean, being educated from an Ivy League in the East Coast, I'm getting this kind of, all I can feel is that this is a close loop. Nobody account for anything. You cannot get anybody to be responsible, okay? If you want to push something through, you can use uh, alternative facts, okay? You can also spin the fact around a little bit, and then and then it's, it's done. I don't know how it get pushed through, but I guess there may be incentive at the end of it, okay? And I have a, all the record of it. so. I'm just glad that somebody would open up and let people know what's going on. Because when I can go through that, I, all I need to get the third party, a third commission outside the city, it's all cleared up. Just like that, okay? But within the city itself, you cannot get anybody responsible. So right now, there's a saying, say, open the skylight and talk in bright lights, okay? In this case, everybody accountable, everybody get accomplished. And for the good of the citizen of Malabo, okay? And also, I know all of you have different perspective. You all of you have different approach to think. That's fine. Please, I want different, you want diversity in the city, okay? You want to be able to work together. And I would like you to get buried the hatchet and then do something together and for the all good of Malabo. And that's all for the transparency of the city and then that work for all of us. Thank you very much. Just I want to say thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I really wanted to talk about the fire up Rambla Pacifico. Well, at least we got rid of one uh, party house though at the cost of one life. I don't think that's a good trade. And I know it's outside the city, but 
we've got to look broader and enlist the help of everyone in the Santa Monica Mountains. But for the last hour, I've watched mostly people criticizing Bruce about his tone. And okay, his tone's too harsh sometimes. But he ran on a position of replacing the city manager. Then he asked for certain information and I think typically, and Reva, of course, knew he was trying to get rid of her. So typically she responds and doesn't give him the information he wants. And that's wrong. Reva does many good things, but transparency isn't one of them. I think she's kind of a control freak. She doesn't release information that should be released at the appropriate time. Um, and I know there's, you know, some of you guys really like her and some don't. But we've got to remember that Bruce and Steve were elected and got the most votes because of their position to replace her. I wish this meeting was a discussion of pros and cons of the city manager instead of the tone of Bruce's um, objections and attacks. We also have to remember that the person who got the most votes running for city council four years ago got the fewest votes this last time, Rick. And and I like Rick, Rick's a friend of mine, that, but he ran on a position supporting Reva. Um, so I, I really think, and, and just look at norms. We all supported Norm's Hotel. I think everybody in the room, I think that was, we were meeting actually in person. And yet it's dragged on and on and on and cost him more and more money. And this is a good project for the city for all the reasons he listed. And yet it drags on. And I hear this over and over that there's something wrong with city hall, things drag on too long. And projects that the people want get buried. So, okay, Bruce's tone isn't right, but I think we have to go for the ultimate transparency and make these things come into the fresh air so that everybody can see. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Next, we'll hear from Georgia Goldfarb. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you, Georgia. Great, thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to thank you all for, for working for Malibu. It's a big responsibility, and I appreciate your time and your effort. And I would urge all to be, to please focus on the substance, the substance of these critical issues that we're discussing in Malibu. So please um, try to set aside personal differences so that we can more easily move forward. And please commenters, hold yourself to the same standards that you're requesting of council members. Um, as has common cause for 50 years, I support transparency and accountability among other good government measures. And I will say that Reba's tenure has not been without controversy. I think we can all agree on that. I do support her decision to resign. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Next we'll hear from Craig Hill. Good evening, council members. And those, those of you out there living the rustic Malibu lifestyle, I hope you're keeping warm. You have a long agenda, so I don't expect you to address tonight the matter I've raised regarding the implications of interfamily property transfers triggered by Proposition 19 and the OWTS certifications that they'll have to go through. But many people will be affected, so please make a note right now to agendize that soon. Secondly, I too don't like the tone. There's no place for the ad hominem sniping on all sides. And, it, you know, it's not my place to tell you who the city manager should or shouldn't be under what terms and conditions. But I do have a few reminders about how that role should be fulfilled. 
Above all, the manager should prioritize the vision and mission statements with their emphases on maintaining rural character and sacrificing urban and suburban conveniences in order to protect our unique environment and lifestyle. So that person must understand deeply that Malibu is not Beverly Hills by the sea. Having that understanding, that person wouldn't countenance paving the civic center with half a mile of concrete sidewalks or allow the paving the bell lot with fairly permanent concrete slurry when only gravel was permitted temporarily or think that a suitable flagship presence for the city at the corner of Webway and PCH would be a parking lot. They wouldn't slow walk the pesticide ban for years. They wouldn't unilaterally decide to start charging occupancy tax for short-term rentals, implicitly allowing STRs where the zoning code prohibits commercial businesses in residential zones, turning neighborhoods into strangerhoods. And when it comes to belt tightening, they would prioritize the cutting of a few staff positions if need be, or delaying the repaving of a few roads for a few years instead of cutting the relatively minor funding for the Environmental Commission or enforcement of the Dark Skies Ordinance or the installation of green cost-saving solar panels for City Hall. Now, I understand that Manager Feldman isn't solely to blame for those examples and others, but hopefully the group of you does see that the city has gotten off track in some important ways and that much of that has happened on her watch. So, Whatever you do from here, I urge you to keep the vision and mission statements front and center in your decision process. That is literally your mission. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Next, we'll hear from Melanie Gosberg. Good evening, council members. Hello. Hi. I'd like to congratulate Bruce Silverstein on doing exactly what he said he would do, getting rid of our city manager. You've managed to fulfill your campaign promise. You've hit the ground running and it only took you one council meeting to get the job done. And congratulations also to Steve Uring. You've endorsed this and supported it, so you get to share the glory. And congratulations as well. I listened to the entire last council meeting, all seven excruciating hours of it. And I knew at the time, it was only a matter of time before Reva gave in. No one could possibly withstand that level of attack for long. We all have our breaking points. And maybe that was the plan, to insult her, belittle her, badger her into submission, just to keep pounding away like a courtroom cross-examination until she gave in. Four years of that, who in their right mind would want to put up with it? I certainly wouldn't. I listened closely to the entire thing all the way till one in the morning. And all I heard from Reva in response were dignified, respectful replies in the face of overwhelming and unrelenting vitriol. It's not surprising she's finally realized this is no way to live or that she's hired an attorney to defend herself. Anyone would do the same. It's hard to imagine this being allowed to go on in any other professional environment, let alone conducted in full view of the public. And there's something very misogynistic about the way that Reva has been treated, because I have to wonder if a man would be treated the same way. So now she's decided to defend herself and the city's exposed to potential litigation because of this relentless bullying, which was both inevitable and preventable. I don't know Reva very well. She's always been helpful and responsive to me when I've contacted her. Maybe she really is the devil incarnate. Maybe it's nothing more than Russian disinformation with a lot of accusations flying, but no facts to back them up. But what I do know as a 30 year resident of this city is that this campaign to get rid of the city manager has set a chilling tone and it has impacted the ability of the city and the council to get the people's business done. I hope tonight is not gonna be another repeat of the last meeting of arguing and grandstanding over every single thing on the agenda, and that you're actually gonna get down to the job you were elected to do, which is to serve the people of Malibu. There are two planning appeals on the agenda tonight. One of them's a fire rebuild. That touches my heart clearly, because I've just started my own fire rebuild. So I know how the family that who who's item is coming before you feels. They've been waiting months for this item to come before council. They lost their home over two years ago. They can't get a permit until the case was resolved. And I hope that their agenda item is gonna get heard tonight and is not gonna get pushed off like most of the items were from the last meeting. I urge the council to cease, cease this childish vindictive squabbling and get to work. 
The ugliness has to stop. It reflects badly on you and it reflects badly on all of us in Malibu. There's a lack of civility and respect here that has taken over with this war being fought at the council level and on social media. And I implore you to sit to bring it to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. We'll hear from John Mazza. You there, John? Okay, now I'm unmuted. I hear you. Okay, uh, how did we get here? How did we get here tonight? We've had a whole bunch of partisan uh, speeches, uh, self-righteous, uh, that, that never voted for Bruce, let's face it. And we have people who voted for Bruce. But we got here because there's an active side of Malibu that was the opposition for years that tried to get things done and nothing ever happened. Seven years for genocide, eight years for short-term rentals, just on and on and on. Uh, opposition to every initiative brought up. And that came to a head in this election because they finally figured out that unless they took charge and did something about it, nothing was going to happen. It's been eight years since Nobu got cited for parking violations. Nada, okay? Now, other people have talked about certain things like that, but we're here because there's a difference of opinion on what this city should do. And two people got elected, number one and number two, that are going to do something about it. So they did. Now, it's been, what, a couple months? And the world has come to an end because... Somehow people aren't getting their way. So I don't know whether this is harassment or not. A lawyer is going to determine that. Lloyd Ahern isn't going to determine that. Okay. Uh, he doesn't know. Nobody that spoke knows. So you need to go and take this to council and find out. But I, I did want to mention something. And the reason I'm speaking, I, I don't know. Okay, I'm not going to give my opinion on whether it's harassment. I'm not going to give my opinion on whether Reeve has been withholding facts, which he's required to give. But I will object to a city manager attacking Jefferson Wagner as if he's some kind of proud boy who's got weapons and she's, she's afraid of him when the house burned down, the weapons burned down, and then to insinuate that he lived outside of the city while he was in office when that has been cleared by the DA. These are known facts. Jefferson has licenses and was clear. So our city manager who works for you guys should not impugn the integrity of somebody like Jefferson Wagner, who you all know, he's an honest guy. He does not need a city manager to say he's a proud boy running around with machine guns and she's afraid of him. He does not be, need somebody to claim he's a criminal when he's been clear. And she should, you're all beating up on Bruce, but Reva Feldman needs to apologize for that statement. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, we'll hear from Howard Redsky. Okay. Sorry, I had uh, trouble unmuting myself. Uh, no good evening, council members. First, I want to thank all of you for your hard work. And second, I want to say we're better than this. For years, we didn't always agree, but we always got along. The way you get things done is by getting to know someone as a person. Then in their capacity in business or government. What I would ask is you get to know Reva, one-on-one, -on -one, Bruce, for a month. No recording, just you and her talk. Then after that, if you still feel the same way, meet with your fellow council people and get them to see your way. Now what it looks like is a vendetta, plain and simple, against Reva. Second, putting agenda items on the calendar that sound good, that we all want, but can't be enforced and probably aren't legal, could cost the city millions in lawsuits. 
the majority won't vote for them and for the sole purpose of later saying these people should be recalled is not what we should be doing. If these items are legal or you have a better way to make them legal, get the city attorney and law scholars to agree that they're legal and enforceable and I'll be the first one to vote for it and vote for and put my heart behind it. Keep in mind, $375,000 can pay for one motorcycle cop for a year or give 15 fire victims free permits. Please think long and hard, because if Reva leaves, who will take her place knowing, what she, or knowing how she's been treated? Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Next, we'll hear from Ryan Embry. Good evening. Uh, the city has so much business to get down to doing. There is a huge financial hit that's about just behind the crest of the hill. The city's budget is going to have to be pared way back. There's going to have to be some programs and probably some staff cuts involved for the city to balance its budget. This um, infighting is a distraction and you really all need to grow up. Being a city manager is a very tough job and it comes with the territory of having to provide the information and back and forth. And you should not fall for this changing of the narrative from transparency, accountability, government reform, any of these things that are perfectly doable and correct and noble in every other city is good enough for Malibu too. And any staff member who's gonna throw it back in your face and say, I'm too busy or um, stop picking on me, um, that's an inappropriate response and period. I don't care what city you're talking about. Uh, the city manager position is going to include interfacing with many other uh, government agencies, outside agencies. It comes with the territory. A lot of times city managers bounce and land in those other opportunities. We lost a city manager or two that way, along the way. But I, the hostility is a cover. This is what people are saying, oh, it gotta be nice to me because we got three in control now. Everybody else needs to just get in line, squash the minority opinion. Uh, can't we all just get along as long as we go my way? That's not the way a public uh, government agency is supposed to work. You're not supposed to squash minority opinion or limit the public or like I'm being limited to three minutes right now when that council didn't even adopt a policy to make that change. It's been a 20 year standard and you're about to cut me off in you know 40 seconds. I wanted to make something very clear about some of your commissioners that spoke to you tonight, uh, three of them on the Public Safety Commission. Um, one of them didn't know what they were talking about. Actually, two of them didn't know what they were talking about. The, the code that established the commission says the commissions may make recommendations on assigned items or things that are prescribed in their duty. They are not a litmus test for what Chris Frost said. They need to go to the P PSC or they must and never go straight to city council. There's been many things that have gone straight to city council. And I can't think of a better one than this overnight camping problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Of everyone that we uh, missed today, Rosemary Ide is the only one that I can find okay. in the participant list. Great. So we'll hear from Rosemary. Okay. Hello. Hi, Rosemary. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, I don't have to say a whole lot, but I do like transparency. I like that we know what's going on fiscally and in other ways in the city. And I think that's all I have to say to this. So I'm brief. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment for item 2A. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, can we have the <clears throat> city manager update? Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. And I just have a few updates. I'll start with our update on COVID-19. Uh, today, LA County reported 8,243 new cases with over a million positive cases. The testing positivity rate in uh, Los Angeles County right now is about 14%. Uh, two weeks ago when I reported this, we were uh, over 20%. So that's uh, good that the positivity rate is going down. Um, in Malibu, we have 295 reported positive cases um, and six deaths uh, still stand. Um, earlier today, Governor Newsom did uh, announce some revised orders and uh, the city has uh, pushed that information out on our COVID-19 uh, website page and there will be an updated order from Los Angeles County on Friday that reflects the opening of certain sectors, including outdoor dining. Um, and Los Angeles County still remains in the purple tier. So uh, the new order go, puts uh, all of the counties back into the colored tiers for reopening. Uh, we do have information available on the city's website of where you can sign up to get an appointment to get a vaccine. Um, so I encourage people to go to the website, uh, which will take you to the link on the county page. Uh, we will also be offering drive-through testing um, at City Hall uh, this week, January 28th from 10 to 2. And again, that information is on the city's website. Um, our numbers for our Woolsey Fire Rebuild stand at 286 single family homes that have been approved by planning, 166 building permits have been issued, and we have 20 homes that have been completed. I'm sure everybody has seen and noticed that our weather has changed. Uh, they, we are expecting some cold and wet weather over the next seven days. Uh, there's about two inches of rain predicted in Malibu over the next few days. Um, so nothing uh, significant that we're concerned about debris flows, um, but we will have crews uh, available and uh, standing by to, to make sure that our roads are safe and open. Our short-term rental permit program, uh, the deadline to have a permit was January 15th. And to date, we've received 192 applications and approved 148 permits for short-term rentals. Uh, currently, uh, earlier today, we checked and there were 313 listings still up. Uh, what we're finding on um, that there are duplicate uh, listings on different platforms. And so we are proactively working with the different platforms to get um, the listings down that um, are not supposed to be there because they've not applied for a permit. And we will stay on that to make sure that happens. Um, I know one of the things that has caused us all a lot of uh, concern are the uh, recent PSPS power outages from Southern California Edison and how that impacts the uh, signals along Pacific Coast Highway. Um, so I've been able to work with Caltrans and Southern California Edison on finding some solutions to that. Uh, earlier today, Rob DeBow, our public works director, and I met with the director from District 7 uh, in Caltrans and his staff and quite a few people from Southern California Edison. Um, and they have committed to replacing uh, multiple backup batteries in signals. Uh, right now, some of the batteries are lasting 30 to 40 minutes and some are lasting four to six hours. The ones that are lasting longer are newer batteries. And so Caltrans has committed to installing new batteries in replacing the ones that aren't lasting as long. They're also looking at doing some solar backup for those batteries and working productively with Southern California Edison to see that if it's possible when there are PSPS events that they can uh, avoid turning off the signals altogether. So um, felt uh, very, very hopeful with finding some solutions to some permanent uh, backup power for our signals. Um, I've also heard recently that quite a few people have had some problems sending emails to the city. Um, I want to assure everybody that that is a result of a very robust and safe spam filter that we have um, that automatically weeds out certain types of emails. If an email comes in with a lot of attachments, if an email has been forwarded multiple times, if it has a zip file attached to it, our filter will automatically block it. So if that has happened to you, please just call City Hall, hit zero during this Business hours um, and give your email address uh, to the receptionist and we'll make sure that your email gets through to anybody. 
Um, and then we have coming up tomorrow, a phase two meeting for the Civic Center Water Treatment Facility. A community meeting will be held virtually at six o'clock um, and we'll be providing a presentation on the status of the project and our next steps forward for those residents who are in that phase two area. Um, we have been uh, very successful in working on finding some funding solutions. Uh, for those of you who remember for the phase one project, we were able to get some very low interest loans from the uh, state revolving fund through the State Water Resources Control Board. And uh, we've had some very productive conversations where we think we'll be able to get that funding again for phase two. So uh, good news on that front. Um, one of the uh, speakers did ask about all of the recent fires, and uh, I will ask uh, one of uh, someone from the Los Angeles County Fire Department to attend our next meeting on February 8th and provide an update uh, to the public on all of the recent fires. Um, but again, uh, good that we have a little rain that'll help uh, quiet down some of the fire danger right now. Um, and then I'd like to just end and um, express my uh, condolences to Kathy Sullivan's family. I had the honor and privilege of working with Kathy uh, for many years when we did the uh, remodel of the Malibu Library and she was just a, a wonderful person. And so uh, my thoughts and prayers are with her family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, comments from city councilors. Um, Go in order that I see them. Uh, Karen, would you like to go? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank all the public speakers, and I'll circle back to that in a minute. Uh, just to let people know what I've been doing. I've been to two contract cities, legislative tours, uh, virtual tours in Sacramento on Zoom. Um, I have been to uh, another seminar, The Eviction Crisis, Is Your Community Prepared? And I don't believe any community is prepared. Uh, I did a, do a Zoom uh, uh, meeting with Congressman Ted Lieu regarding his homeless veterans plan uh, at the West LA VA. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that some of the unhoused population in Malibu are veterans. Uh, there are very ambitious plans in the works uh, at the VA, and I am hopeful that some of the unhoused here will be eligible, eligible for housing and services at the soon-to-be-expanded VA. Um, I represented our COG this morning in a county board of supervisors city selection committee. We had one item on that regarding Metro. Um, I also wonder in my comments if there would be consensus to put out a request for proposal for an independent third party investigation of the Wagner affidavit. I would suggest that it would be not to exceed $25,000. And I'm wondering if I have a second for that. I'll um, second it. Um, okay. Um, Discussion on it? Mayor Pearson, this is not an agenda. Yeah, it's not an agenda item, so yeah, thank you. We cannot take action on this. So do you want to make that an agenda item, Karen? Well, uh, we can discuss it when we get down to the, um, whatever that is, 7F, I think. Sorry, it's been renumbered. 7F. I, I can bring it back up then. Okay. okay well, um, regarding some of the public speakers, I want to thank people. Uh, I too am dismayed by the uncivilized uh, comments, uh, social media, in council meetings, in correspondence, uh, and the civil discourse has become decidedly uncivil, and I think anyone can see that. I want to thank Daphne and Neat for her perspective. Um, I, I am happy to have her uh, joining the rest of the Public Safety uh, Commission. And um, I agree, insulting, mistreating, and disrespecting any city employee, uh, any commissioner, uh, or any elected official is not productive. And in fact, it's counterproductive. Um, so many people have asked us tonight to get back to the business of the city. There's nothing I want to do more 
we're wasting time. We're, uh, I don't even know what to call this. We're just devolving. Um, and for everybody who has said, this is disappointing, it's beneath us, I agree 100%. So I'm not gonna belabor that uh, too much more. Um, so those are my comments and thank you to everybody who spoke tonight. Okay, um, Steve. Yes, I've been spending my time getting phone calls and reading emails from people who live in the city. And a couple items have come up. And, and this one I hit before, you know, the short-term rentals, there has been requests to put that in an online database. Uh, and it seems to make some sense to me for two reasons. One, because there's agenda items later on that say, you know, the staff doesn't have enough time. And if every time somebody wants to know who the short-term rentals are, someone's got to pull that file and send it out. That just seems to be in, in the year 2021, uh, an unnecessary use of manpower. So we should be able to get that online. And I'll, I'll bring it up later on, but hopefully you'll take a look at that and see if that's possible, especially too with that fire they had on Rambla. You know, if, if you know that there are those places out there uh, and we can identify those that may not have the proper fire protection stuff or whatever, it may even help save a couple lives. Uh, I got an email regarding the poison tree in Malibu, apparently up on Zuma Beach in this new uh, program that's going on up there. They're using some poisons uh, that we probably shouldn't be using. So maybe if we can figure out how to at least you know, talk to those people and see if we can suggest they don't do that. Um, I got some other stuff. Maybe next meeting, someone could come back and just tell us what's going on with Norm's Hotel. I mean, I, you know, I get calls from him. I get calls from other people. We heard Scott Dietrich. This thing sort of has been dragging out. So if we can sort of get a status of where we think it is, where we think it's going to move forward, I think that would be helpful for everybody. And with that, we got a lot of stuff to go. So, Mike, I'll send it back to you. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, Bruce? Okay. Hey, everybody. So let me begin by saying, first of all, I do work very hard at being a spiritual human being, whether you believe it or not. In fact, that's what drove me following the Woolsey fire to become a fierce advocate on the part of residents who lost their homes to the fire. Uh, and I'll note, there's nothing inconsistent between being fierce or intense on the one hand and being spiritual on the other. Now, last week, my spirituality did not join me at the meeting. There's no question about it. I wish it had not been so, but it was. Um, there's no question that my side of the street is not entirely clean last week. And for that, I apologize. But I'm not the only one whose better angels were not enforced last week. And I'm hoping we can all be in a better place this week, truly. Um, I want to note um, news-wise, before I, I speak some more, um, I. Everyone understands from the news today, the, the stay at home order for the state was lifted. Someone might know better than me, but it's my understanding that has not occurred for LA County. So I, I, it's not necessarily cause for early celebration. I hope people are still going to be staying safe in our city. Uh, now, over the past two weeks, I've been, fl oh, and, and, and I wanna say one thing before I start. Pam and Ham Hamish, beautiful. I, your words were beautiful, and I, and I, and I deeply appreciate them. Um, I might have some comments about some other people, but th th that was fabulous, and I, con I concur with you 100%. Um, I have been flooded over the past two weeks with comments in support of what's going on. That's so upsetting to so many people who spoke tonight, who came here with both barrels loaded in their shotguns. There's some serious issues right now with the city manager. We're not going to talk about them tonight. We had a private, we had a closed session the other day. We're going to have more closed sessions. I'm not going to say what we said. You have a point of order? My point of order is we're not supposed to discuss anything like that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't think I did. Um, I want to thank um, Lisa. I, Lisa, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Sagar, the assistant city manager, for helping me work through the warrant this week. I requested copies of contracts and invoices for a number of issues, items. They were provided to me promptly. 
My questions were answered by those documents. And um, I do believe the city manager certification in the warrant is improper for reasons that I'll not belabor tonight, but we'll, we'll talk about them another day. Now, again, I've had many written comments from people who've expressed the view that the city manager should be immediately replaced on administrative leave. But those have been public comments that were submitted in writing to this council, but we don't get to, they don't get read into the public record because nobody spoke them orally. But there have been comments and I concur. Well, there've been comments about that. And I, and I would encourage everyone in the public to get a hold of the public written comments that have been submitted to the city and read them because they're, they're very informative. Now, last week and again today, 10 or 15 members of the public, maybe more, came and spoke ill of me and complained about what I am doing. Plainly, frankly, and I'm not do and, I, and I, again, I will do this as spiritually and as um, cordially and professionally as I can going forward, but plainly I'm doing something right. I'm not about to back down. I mean, in my campaign, I committed to do exactly what I'm working to do. And it's not what you think I'm doing, but 2,414 registered voters voted for me. I'm not about to back down on my campaign commitments because a dozen or so members, two dozen, even 50, if you want to bring them, members of the public come here and complain. They, for the most part, those people didn't want to see me elected and they're disturbed that I'm doing what I was elected to do. And I don't doubt there are people who voted for me who are disturbed. There also are people who didn't vote for me who have told me they wish they had. So it's, 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 there's a mixed bag out there. But in essence, the people that are complaining are complaining about their dissatisfaction with the election result more than anything else. And we've seen that occur at the national level as well. If you want to go round up 2,415 registered voters to come and tell me to stop, I'll give it serious consideration. But for now, I'm going to continue to do what I campaigned to do. And it was not to remove the city manager. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, I do have a question. I don't know how to get this question. Asked, but Mr. Balti last week represented that he represents a witness in the Weezar litigation, whatever that means. I, I would like to understand more about that, because as everyone knows, the Weezar litigation is related potentially to the allegations in Mr. In Jefferson Wagner's affidavit. Anyway, I'm not suggesting by any means that everyone who came here and spoke against me is friends with or beholden to the city manager in some manner or another, but many are. And this is exactly part of what I have been talking about. And again, I say these words with all sincerity and I do not say them lightly. This is the problem with deceitfulness, duplicity, and unethical behavior. And I welcome an investigation by an outside, competent, experienced attorney with respect to everything that's been going on. I welcome it with open arms. Daphne, I couldn't be happier with my decision to appoint you as a commissioner based on your comments tonight. You spoke, you spoke against what I'm doing based on your perception of it not being appropriate. And I applaud you after I appointed you that position for doing that. That's exactly why I appointed you, an independent thinker. And that's why I said last week, last two meetings ago, and I'll re repeat it again, I hope that you will stand for city council in two years. I was going to read parts of about 50 comments I've received from people that are the diametric opposite of what people said tonight. But I won't, we have a long agenda and I won't waste time doing that. But believe me, there are many, even comments from a council member from another city encouraging me and applauding me for what I am doing. It's not to say there haven't been detractors. There certainly have. Um, last week, one council member did lecture and berate me. And I have to say I was spoken to in a way and with what seemed to be hatred that I have never experienced and never myself done. And I do think we all need to take a serious look in the mirror before we proceed. And I do look forward to getting things done with you all. I truly do. Um, 
I could say a lot more, but I won't. I've taken enough time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to getting the things on the agenda tonight. I, I've spent a ton of time. I spent over six hours preparing for item 4A to make sure I understood the law and the facts, and it's an amazingly complex matter, and I look forward to dealing with it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who have, are watching, the people who took the time to talk and make comments, and the people who have written us all letters and sent us all letters, which is very nice. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is take a moment just to thank the firemen who got on that Rambla Pacifico fire immediately while the wind was howling and, and got it out. Uh, and one of the things that has been going on during these nights with the temperatures so high, Arson Watch has had at least 20 people out during each of those nights looking for someone who's doing something stupid. So I'm, I'm glad that the firemen were there. I'm glad they put it out. I can't wait for, I'm glad that it's raining. And I wanna thank everybody for tuning in and I can't wait to get to the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I'll keep my comments short so you can move on. Thank you. To all the speakers, thanks for being involved. Uh, appreciate everyone's input. Um, I want to congratulate Martin Copenhafer, the oldest member of the Malibu Navy League. He just turned 100 years old. He's a Normandy D-Day veteran as well, and um, fantastic accomplishment. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, our Navy League does great things, and uh, 100 years old. I don't even think my wife would want me to live, be around that long. It'd be a real pain, but uh, good for him. So excellent. And really, the only other thing I want to say has been said by many people. Um, we do need to be civil. And we need to do a better job. I commit to it for myself. And as we go forward through our meetings, um, if it gets lost anywhere along the way, I'm I'm gonna chime in and try and bring it back. And I expect to be called out if that happens my way. Um, none of us are immune to it. It's been a difficult time. Certainly it's been a difficult time on a lot of levels nationwide. And sadly here in Malibu too. And I think uh, Hamish put it perfectly. And I really appreciate his comments about as a community, we look, look inward. And as a city council, we look inward. We have a lot to do and we were elected to get those things done. So with that said, we'll move on. And we're at the consent calendar. Do members of the public wish to call any, pull anything on the consent calendar? Item 3A1 has been pulled. Say it, I'm sorry, one more time. Item 3A1. 3A1 has been pulled. Okay, anything pulled by the council? Steve, I can't hear you. I would like to pull 3B4 for a very quick question. 3B4, okay. Anything else to be pulled? Okay, can I have a motion on the rest of the consent calendar? I will Make move on the rest of the consent cal calendar, pulling items 3A1 and 3B4, which I believe was for a quick question, not a full staff report. Okay, do a second. Paul is gonna second. Can I get roll call on that, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grassanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Councilmember Silverstein? Trying to unmute right now. I'm sorry, it was muted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Council I said yes instantly. <laughs> no worries. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. And Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, now we're to 3A1, second reading adoption of ordinance number 479. And I gather it's a member of the public who's pulled this. It is Barry Haldeman. Okay, um, do we need a staff report or should we just go to the public hearing? I don't have anything else to add um, besides this is the second reading of the ordinance that you considered last meeting. Um, okay. I'm not sure that um, his comments are specific about this, but we will see. Okay, Barry, are you there? 
<clears throat> yes, I am. And in the interest of time, I will uh, withdraw from my comment and make it the next time when we have a little more time. So um, I'm not against the ordinance. I wanted to raise something else related to it. Okay, up to you. Um, but I guess we're done with public comment. And um, do we have any comments or a motion? I'll make, oh, I'll, oh. I'll make a motion to approve 3B, 3A1. Okay, and Paul, are you seconding that? I'll second. Okay, roll call, please. Oh, wait, hang on a second. Uh, Bruce, you're unmuted. Sorry, so I have a quick question. I, I, as I read 3A1, it's not really an action by council. Is that accurate? You, well, I lost half of what you said. As I, when I read 3A1, I understood it to mean to be simply a reading or a waiver of a reading, but it's not really an action on the actual ordinance itself. We're simply, it's simply a reading. Is that, am I accurate in saying that? So second this reading. is second reading and adoption. Councilmember right. Shelton, this, this ordinance was, a, uh, was introduced at your last meeting. It's on tonight's agenda for adoption. So your action tonight would be to adopt the ordinance. Okay, thank you. And was there any more comments? No? Okay. So I think we have a motion and a second. Can we have roll call, please? That was from uh, Councilmember Yearing, and who was the second? Paul. Paul. Okay. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Ferrer? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, uh, we are on to 3B4, Amendment to Professional Service Agreement with Kimley Horn and Associates. And I guess we had a quick question, okay. Uh, the Civic Center Way Improvement Project seems to be on hold at the moment, uh, awaiting some work from Waters District 29. That's what I was told. And I'm just wondering if this 25 grand is related to that or if that's something else. No, it, it's it's kind of related to a, a number of um, um, unforeseen kind of conditions. Oh, there's some additional pavement repairs that we have to make. Um, they're helping us design that. But they're also helping us um, with the dark sky light, and they're also providing me with some other direction on on some other improvements we can we can possibly do to those intersection signals too, and see what we can do. I, one of the things I'm, I was uh, possibly thinking about doing was um, painting the, the signal poles, a not a silver color, but maybe something that's more rural color and something that matches to, to our surroundings. So that's what um, part of this funds were going to be used for. I'll make a motion to approve three before. Hey, do we have a, do we have a second? Oh. Second. Okay, can we have roll call? Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. So we are. Hang on, sorry, one second. Piles of paper here. We are on to 4A, appeal number 19002 and coastal development permit 17-043 and associated entitlements at 29043 Gray Fox. Can we have a report, please? Good evening, Mayor Pearson and members of the City Council. What you have before you this evening is an appeal of a coastal development permit and a site plan review, and then also a demolition permit to remove the existing home. This item is an appeal that's been filed by the property owner regarding the denial of the planning commission's approval. This is Mayor, the second- Mayor Pearson, if, if, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. My understanding was that there may be a conflict on this issue. Oh, yes. That there is a conflict that we would need a recusal at this point. Okay. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, they came before the planning commission, right? But Bruce, go ahead. 
I have a question of counsel. And also, before we ask questions or do anything, do we need to do disclosures or does that come up later? We do that before the public hearing happens. So you can do it after the staff report is OK. So my question is, John. Yes, sir. Is there a explicit provision in the code, in any code, or a definitive ruling by a court that says that a planning commissioner who sat on a matter and is later elected to the city council must recuse himself in a de novo review that is not a review of the propriety of the planning commission's decision, but an actual decision in the first instance by the city council? Council Service, I believe due process would require that a council member be disinterested. And while there's no FPPC conflict, we're dealing with a general concept of bias under the due process clause. Because Council Member Uring expressed his views on this topic by voting on the matter, hearing the matter, and considering the matter at the planning commission level, I believe that due process would require that he recuse himself so that the applicants and all the public involved essentially have a disinterested decision-making body. And by the virtue of the fact that he appeared, not appeared, acted as a member of the planning commission, he would likely be considered by a court to not be disinterested if it were to come to that. Come out of here. Wait, wait, just before you do, I seriously appreciate that answer. Is there any decisional law that's ever addressed that question, or is that simply your view based on the issue of bias? I believe that there are cases that talk about, there is decisional law with regard to the concept of disinterested decision-makers. I don't know that there's a case directly on point as between a planning commissioner who's been elevated to the council by virtue of election, but I would argue that the due process provisions that I just discussed would still be applicable. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, I'm out of here, guys. Call me when you're ready. Thank you, Steve. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Molitor. Not a problem at all. As I was explaining on the history of this project, this project was originally heard by the city council in October of 2019 on appeal filed by the property owner. The city council did hear the item. They provided comment on the item, and as a result of that comment, the project was remanded back to the planning commission, and the property owner did reduce the size of the home, as we'll discuss later in this presentation, and also did meet with a concerned neighbor who brought up his views and concerns at the planning commission hearing. At the most recent planning commission hearing, there were four planning commissioners that discussed this, and they were unable to reach a conclusion or a vote whether to deny it or approve it, and as a result, we're now back at the city council to effectively continue the appeal hearing and render a final decision on this. Next slide, please. This is a vicinity map and aerial photo to show the location of where the property is located. This property is located along Gray Fox, and the portion of Gray Fox is directly adjacent to Point Dume Elementary School. This is not the portion of Gray Fox that ends in a cul-de-sac near the water. This is more in central Point Dume. Next slide, please. The project, as proposed, is the demolition of the existing single-family residence that sits on the site today, which is roughly 4,700 square feet, and the construction of a new single-family residence that will be a two-story residence that is roughly close to 6,400 square feet in size. It is just short of that. The applicant proposes a four-car garage, first and second floor loggias or outdoor areas, and there's other associated development proposed with the project, such as swimming pool, driveway, fire truck turnaround, landscaping and hardscape, and some grading. Next slide, please.
What you have before you here is a two thirds exhibit. This was part of the discussion at the planning commission. And the question was whether or not the second floor of this house was massive, did it fit with the neighborhood? And what the property owner did along with the applicant is they went back to the architect and they did remove some square footage as part of this uh, opportunity when it was remanded back to the planning commission. The area you see in blue was the original proposal. As you can see, the first floor was roughly 4,500 square feet and a second floor that was close to 3,000 square feet. The middle diagram shows in yellow the current proposed second floor overlaying on the original blue proposal and the first floor in gray. And on this proposal, the final all the way to the right of the screen where you just have the yellow, the second floor has been reduced from a TDSF of 3,000 square feet down to 1,840 square feet. Next slide, please. The upper uh, picture here in this elevation shows the area as originally proposed. This is when you view it from the street. And the lower picture is what is currently proposed. And as you can see, there was a reduction of some massing as it appears from the street that the area to the right of the tower has been removed. Next slide, please. This is a view looking towards the east. This would be if you were standing uh, inside the property looking at the east and what you can see there in yellow over the previously proposed is you can see some of the areas where the massing has changed. As I mentioned, the biggest changes uh, were around the tower element. There was some reduction there of what was on the right hand side of that tower in the previous power uh, slide on this PowerPoint. And you also see in about the middle of the building where they removed the roof and they created this covered, or excuse me, covered loggia area, which is open to the sky, uh, but does have, it basically is enclosed on three sides and then overlooks out towards the swimming pool. Next slide, please. These are some photographs of how the, the proposed project will look when viewed from Gray Fox. What we did here was outline the story poles and uh, superimpose the outline of the building there in red. Next slide, please. This is a view from the northeast of the proposed residence from Gray Fox Street, and you can see the story poles and the massing there as it relates to the neighboring property. Next slide, please. This is a view again from Gray Fox from the Northeast, looking at the proposed residence and you can see how the mature landscaping there does kind of shield the view from the story poles, of the story poles, excuse me. Next slide, please. This is a view of the property from the Western property line. So this would be looking to, from the, this would be the view that the neighbor would have looking at the home and the two story element there that you see above the uh, parked car there. Next slide, please. This would be a view if you had your back to the elementary school and you were closer to the intersection there of uh, Gray Fox and uh, I want to say Dune Drive, this would be what you would see from that looking at the corner, looking towards the proposed prop uh, property. Next slide, please. The Planning Commission denied the project on the basis that they were unable to make all of the required findings for the site plan review. And they discussed that in the Planning Commission's opinion, the project did not um, match the character of the neighborhood and they found that it adversely affected neighborhood character, which is a term that is specifically called out in finding two of the site plan review findings. And therefore, because the planning commission was unable to make the required findings for the site plan review, 
the house being proposed over 18 feet in height did not qualify to conform with the requirements of the LCP. And as a, re as a result, the Planning Commission denied the project. Next slide, please. The appeal that was filed by the property owner contends that the Planning Commission's findings were not supported by the evidence in the record, and it was contrary to law. It is the appellant's position that the Planning Commission utilized an improper standard, which was the use of neighborhood stand, uh, excuse me, a neighborhood character, and based it off of uh, comparing square footages of surrounding properties. However, as mentioned, the Planning Commission was utilizing words that were in the finding, and it was in their opinion that the project did not meet the character of the neighborhood and therefore the second floor could not be supported. However, based on the allowable square footage on, that is allowed on the site, two thirds calculations, the projects demonstrated conformance with the city's local coastal program as well as the city's municipal code. Furthermore, as illustrated in the materials that you have before you in the agenda report and in the resolution, uh, staff is also able to make all the other additional findings that are required as part of the site plan review, such as uh, impacts on solar access. The property does not seem to do that. And also, there does not seem to be any impacts to anyone's primary view, uh, whether private primary views or public views. The appeal also contends that the applicant was denied a fair and impartial hearing. Staff reviewed the minutes from the uh, the original meeting as well as watch the video and the applicant was given a fair hearing there's no evidence that they were not given a fair hearing they were given their 15 minutes to speak um, and also they followed up with some additional questions and answers with the planning commission and there was a, a public hearing that was conducted consistent with city policies and practices next slide please Staff would like to point out, however, that there is a suggested revision tonight to the resolution 21-02. We recommend a modification in paragraph two, which is page four of 21 of the resolution, or page 15 in your agenda packet. And the addition would be the word changes, which you see here in about the middle of the paragraph in bold uh, black type with the yellow highlight. Uh, currently, that finding reads second floor and make additional to better reflect. It should be make additional changes to better reflect the character of the neighborhood. Uh, this relates to the fact that the applicant as a result of the project being remanded to the Planning Commission did reduce a little over a thousand square feet from the second floor. Next slide, please. Staff is available for any questions, as well as the applicant, who is also the appellant. Staff recommends adoption of Resolution 21-22, upholding the appeal and approving Coastal Development Permit 17-43 and its associated requests. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, city Councilors, can we have disclosures, please? Um, Karen? I have nothing to disclose. Um, I Bruce? did not do any site visit. Oh. Okay. Bruce, any disclosures? Yes. And, and because this is the first time I'm doing this, I'm going to be a little longer than I will normally be because what I'm going to say, I'll never have to say again because I'll have said it tonight. First of all, specifically to this, I had multiple ex parte communications with a representative of the applicant for the permitted issue in this matter. That's Don Schmitz. The first communication was in response to an email that he sent to all city council members or his assistant did requesting that we each participate in a site visit, presumably where a representative of the applicant would explain the site. I declined that invitation in a written communication, which is an ex parte communication that I copied to the city clerk and the city attorney. The second ex parte communication was in response to an email to all city council members describing the history of the appeal and urging that this matter be heard tonight and not postponed to a later date. I responded again in writing to that 
Thanks for the informative email, Don. I know nothing about the merits of your client's application, but I agree with you that it should be heard on Monday, and I will oppose any effort to postpone the item if such an effort should arise. That was my ex parte communication. The balance of the commun ex parte communications with a representative of the applicant were emails I sent to the city attorney, John Cotty, requesting his legal advice on multiple issues raised by the appeal that I needed help on. I copied Mr. Schmidt so he would know what my questions were, not the answers, but what my questions were, so that he would have an opportunity to address them tonight if he deemed it appropriate to do so. Again, that's all in writing and the city has that all in its server. I also had an ex parte communication with Mr. Stockwell, one of the neighbors who was opposing this application, and that was thanking him for providing his written objection and letting him know that I may have questions of him at the hearing. Finally, I did receive answers to my questions from Trevor Rusin, which were extremely helpful to me in working through the legal issues. Those answers are privileged, so I won't be disclosing what they were. All of this occurred in writing. I didn't speak with anyone other than Trevor Rusin about the merits of the appeal. I provided copies of all written communications to the city clerk. I know nothing further about this appeal beyond what I've read in the council agenda report. Now, this is the thing I, I won't have, to, I will say tonight and I won't say it again. The California Supreme Court has instructed that city council consideration of appeals from permit decisions of the planning commission, as well as original decisions of the city council pertaining to building permits, variances, and property specific zoning decisions are quasi judicial administrative actions in which the city council members act in a quasi adjudicatory capacity, according to the court, similar to judges. When functioning in such an adjudicatory capacity, city council members must be neutral and unbiased. We heard that from Mr. Cotty earlier, meaning they must be free of any conflict of interest, not prejudge specific facts of the case, free of prejudice against or in favor of any party or any person directly affected by the decision. Allowing an unbiased decision maker to participate in the decision is enough to invalidate the decision. In addition to requiring decision makers who are neutral and free from bias, quasi adjudicatory matters require both a reliable and trustworthy record upon which decisions can be made and a record that is equally available to all decision makers. Public confidence in the process also requires that the entire record upon which decisions are made be publicly available so members of the public can both, both offer their views and form their own views of the propriety of the quasi adjudication. A reliable, trustworthy, equally available and public record also is required to ensure that any party aggrieved by the quasi adjudication can make an informed determination to pursue or forgo an appeal or a lawsuit where, that, where those avenues exist and to ensure that a further reviewing body will have a full record of the bases for the quasi adjudication and any information that they may be inconsistent with that adjudication. In the case of this appeal, like many that have preceded it, some but all, not all city council members may have conducted site visits engaged in unrecorded ex parte conversations with one or more parties and may have engaged in such communications with members of the city staff who are recommending a particular action. Presumably the members of the city staff similarly engaged in ex parte communications when formulating their own recommendation. For these reasons, when I was invited to meet with a representative of the applicant for the permit at issue in this matter to conduct a site visit, and speak with the applicant's representative, I declined to do so, explaining some of what I just said. While there will be disclosures in this appeal and others by city council members of the fact of ex parte and extrajudicial extra communications, there cannot be an exposition of what was said and seen in full. There cannot be a full and fair exposition of unrecorded private communications and activities. It's not physically, not humanly possible. Nobody has that memory to be able to recount it. In my view, a truly neutral, unbiased and reliable quasi adjudicatory decision simply cannot be made in that environment. I understand and appreciate that that is business as usual in Malibu City Council, as it is in many other places, but that does not make it right. In that regard, I do note that the city of Belmont has an exemplary ethics code, which provides among other things, 
Item number seven, communication. For adjudicative matters pending before the body, members shall refrain from receiving information outside of an open public meeting or the agenda materials, except on the advice of the city attorney. Members shall publicly disclose substantive information that is relevant to a matter under consideration by the body, which they may have received from sources outside of the public decision-making process. They also have a conflict of interest policy, which is fascinating and, and broader than ours. Ethics codes in other cities include similar provisions, some stronger, some weaker. And I understand from the city attorney that the city of Los Angeles simply prohibits, prohibits ex parte communications in these matters altogether. Notwithstanding the foregoing, I remain ready, willing, and able to consider this appeal as best I'm able to do so, even though I may not have all, all the same information that every decision maker has. I do note, however, that whichever party to this appeal may end up being aggrieved by the decision we are going to make, will ha will likely have a credible basis for a legal challenge that if they if there is information that's been provided to one or more adjudicators that is not entirely available to all adjudicators to make their decision. Now, I know there's going to be people who are disturbed with me for raising these issues. That's unfortunate. As I see things, it's my legal responsibility to raise these issues, and I will continue to raise issues of this nature as I see them. Thank you. All disclosures. Disclosures. Uh, I received a set of 11 by 17 plans from the city as part of uh, the package. I spent several hours looking at the plans. I got a call from Don Schmitz's office, actually it was an email, offering me an ex parte visit to the property, which I accepted. Uh, I wanted to walk the property and see the, how the property next to it sits and the property on either side of it sits. I did that. Uh, it's, you know, I didn't learn anything that wasn't in writing, except the, the way the land slopes and actually the relationship of the house and the houses around it to each other. And I think that that is the reason we should always try to at least drive by these things. And that's what I did. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I also received several, the same emails you all received from people telling me which way they thought I should vote. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, did you learn anything in your visit that is informed your decision tonight? I think that the ter the uh, terrain, while while depicted in the in the uh, in the topographic plan, is is properly depicted here, I find that I need to walk on it to, to understand it. And I did that. So the information was available. Uh, I feel I have a better handle on it because I was there. So I don't know if that's uh, impermissible to actually understand what I'm talking about, but I... No, the, the purpose is if there's any information that's not in the staff report or the public record. Your, your personal experience of it does not change the, the fact that, you know, there wasn't any accuracy or anything else you noticed during that that you would base your decision upon that is not otherwise um, part of the record. No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't see any inaccuracy. What I did see was the lot in relation to the lots around it and a chance to walk up and down the sidewalk across the street. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for myself, I first visited this site as a planning commissioner, and but the item never came before us. I believe, maybe Trevor could help me, it was because I got elected to city council that I went from looking at the property to nothing. <laughs> um, and that project, I believe, has changed quite a bit since... Uh, so I didn't rule on it anyhow. Um, I also received an invitation from Mr. Schmitz. I visited the property and walked around part of it, um, met the tenant that was there, 
um, which revealed nothing, saw the, uh, got the ability to see the, um, the um, holes, <laughs> name just went right out of my head with little red flags that I've been dealing with for eight or nine years and I can't remember the name all of a sudden. Um, the reason I like to visit is I don't have the ability to understand what a project looks like by just seeing it in plans. Um, I do not discuss the project in any formative way with whoever is there. I uh, also offered to visit the project with the neighbor, um, John, and um, but he, I believe, was out of town, and we did not connect to look at it together. Um, what did I learn by visiting the site? I just got a better idea of what it looks like on the ground that I'm unable to do from plans. Um, everything in the plans was accurate. Everything in the staff report was accurate, but seeing it in 3D is very helpful to me and um, just gave me a more thorough understanding of what the applicant has done with the project and in hopes of it passing here tonight. So with that said, I'm sure we have some public speakers. Um, we have Don Schmitz and Greg Gaines for the appellant team. Okay. So let's unmute. All right, council members, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. A point of order before we start the clock, which hopefully will be a lot more generous in three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gaines is here to answer questions. And if possible, I'd like to retain uh, uh, four minutes uh, for rebuttal. So if uh, you could set the clock at the traditional 11 minutes, uh, I will take it from there. And I do have a PowerPoint presentation, if we could pull that out. And I can't see the clock. Is the clock uh, up before we start it? Just one second, Don. Okay, you what, Trevor? I was going to say, will he be able to see it during if he's presenting a PowerPoint over the same thing, or do, would, you, would you prefer? No. <laughs> no, but I set it at 11 minutes. So okay, and I'll set my stopwatch here. I'm, 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 I'm ready to go. So you let me know when you're starting to go. You're all ready. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, again, for the record, Council Members Don Schmitz, I very much appreciate your time and attention to this. Next slide, please. So the site plan uh, has been uh, presented a number of times uh, to the council, to the planning commission. It's a traditional single family home uh, point to proposed project, but let's get to uh, some of the issues that have been raised. Next slide, please. So our neighbor, Mr. Stockwell has opposed uh, for a protracted period of time, going back to early 2019 to the project design. One of the principal concerns was that the turrets and viewing room looked directly down onto his property. Next slide, please. So currently the, pro the closest portion of the uh, house is 17 foot and six inches next to uh, Mr. Stockwell's property. Next slide, please. And we're uh, actually increasing the side yard setback for the closest portion of the property from what currently exists. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. And you can see existing setbacks 10 foot. Next slide, please. Which will be increased. Next slide, please. So the uh, tower is in fact 28 feet. It's on the further side of the property. Next slide, please. And then the bedrooms are on the second story. Next slide, please. And the bedroom is 116 and a half feet from uh, Mr. Stockwell's guest house. Next slide. And uh, the 136 feet from his house. Next slide, please. And his guest house in the back, the roof is at the ground floor grade of our client, Mr. Atwell's application. Next slide, please. So the uh, staff report reflects this, that the subject project is designed with two-story portion on the western side of the project to minimize the impacts of Mr. Stockwell's property. Next slide, please. Uh, it goes on to say that the surrounding neighborhood is a mixture of one or two-story residences. Next slide, please. 
There was an objection letter recently filed that talks that second story homes are not part of this neighborhood. Next slide, please. But in actuality, three of the existing five homes right here on Gray Fox are two story homes. Next slide. And within the surrounding area for a 500 foot radius, 57% of the homes are two stories. A second story uh, on this project, a site plan review is entirely within the keeping of the neighborhood character. Next slide, please. And this is reflected in this staff report. Next slide. Uh, it, it also talks about how this house has an appropriate front yard setback, which is really important when you are assessing potential visual impacts. Next slide. As you can see here, the proposed house has a full 65 foot front yard setback to the first floor, an additional 10 foot to the second story component, 75 feet from the house, whereas Mr. Stockwell next door is 32 feet. He reduced the front yard setback with a minor modification by 50%. Next slide. And if you take a look at the neighborhood, you can see that the proposal before you is superior to the houses which are currently in existence, including the existing house along Gray Fox. Next slide. And we're gonna move a little bit quicker here because I'm running out of time. This is Mr. Stockwell's house. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> 29055 uh, to the west of us, uh, single story house, but very close to the street and is written a letter of support. Next slide, please. And you can see this is the way that the house would look because it's set further back in the uh, surrounding development. It's, it, it, it has a much smaller visual impact than those closer to the street. Next slide, please. Uh, 29075, it's a two story home all the way across the front. Next slide, please. And it sits up on top of the uh, uh, a higher elevation. So it gives a much more massive feel than the other houses within the neighborhood. Next slide, please. And then 29089, Great Fox is a fairly large home, but it has a full front yard setback. Next slide, please. And therefore it does not have significant visual impacts just as the subject application will not. Next slide. So uh, we were in front of the city council and the council wanted us to take a stronger look at this. It wasn't about the overall size of the house, but the council wanted the second story to be reflective of the average of the second stories within the general area. It's not a TDSF issue. Next slide, please. Which is fine. The house which is in front of you tonight, council members, is significantly smaller, almost 2,000 square foot from the maximum allowable total development square footage on this property. Next slide. So we did a full second story analysis. Next slide, please. And the second story analysis that we did was predicated upon a review of the building permits and the coastal development permits. It wasn't guesswork. And so we went around in the area. Next slide, please. Grasswood, you can see this is a Ministry of Coastal Development Permit. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, this is a building permit from the city of Malibu. Next slide, please. These are both on Grasswood in the immediate area. You can see a copy of the building permit. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And going over on the, onto Fernhill Drive, uh, again, building permits. This one's second story. Next slide, please. It's 1,547 square feet. And you, again, you can see this is not guesswork. This is a uh, copy of the building permit. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the average second story within this area is 1,842 square foot. That's the average size of some that are larger, some that are smaller, but our marching orders from this council was to go back and redesign the project reflective of the average. Next slide, please. And so the staff has already stolen my thunder. They've taken these excellent exhibits that we produce that shows how we reduced it by 40% on that second story. Next slide, by 1,233 square feet. Next slide, please. And this has really reduced the massing as you see it from the street, which is what's most important to the public view. Show. And by the way, nobody has ever asserted a primary view impact from this project. It simply is not happening. Next slide, please. So I'll move quickly here. Staff has already shown these slides to you. Next slide. Next slide. So the staff report is reflective of these modifications that we've reduced it down to 1,840 square foot, which helps the project more blend in with the average within the neighborhood. Next slide, please. 
This shows the uh, how we reduce the floor plans. We whacked the bedroom. We reduce the size of the bedroom. It's a bit of a misnomer to call the area top a loggia. A loggia is a covered area. By the way, uh, uh, Councilman asked a question in regards to whether or not the loggia underneath was included in the TDSF. It is. Uh, but you can see this is a good faith effort to significantly reduce the size of the second story and the visibility of the second story. Please keep in mind, council members, that this project is a clean sheets project. It's concisely consistent with the LCP. The only discretionary action in front of you tonight is the site plan review for the second story. Next slide, please. So this shows a silhouette of uh, Mr. Stockwell's house uh, to the east of us and the previously proposed bulk of the uh, second story that we had in front of the council before. Next slide, please. And this shows the reductions from uh, in, in the re reduction in the bulk and massing of the second story from Gray Fox. Next slide, please. So uh, Mr. Stockwell's second story is very small facing the streets, 26 feet. Uh, our width was, was pretty small before, it was 45 feet. It's been reduced down to 36 and a half feet. Next slide. And those should both be held in comparison to the house just two, two uh, lots over, which has 110 feet of frontage at a higher elevation on Gray Fox that is second story. That is dramatically more. It's almost as much as Mr. Stockwell's second story and our second story put together facing the street. Next slide. The point is that is the neighbor immediate neighborhood character. Next slide, please. So we had a number of meetings with Mr. Stockwell and uh, we had a video conference call with him on August 11. Uh, at that point, uh, 2020, uh, at that point, Mr. Stockwell said that he supported the development of an 1800 square foot second floor, but he wanted us to uh, once again, redesign the second story. By the way, Mr. Stockwell's also told us he would be fine if our clients built the full 8,000 square foot uh, TDSF permissible on the property if it was a one story home. Uh, we took a look at his suggestions that pertains to the second story. It just cuts up the uh, second story too much uh, for us to put the square footage, ironically, on the eastern side of the, of the tower closer to his house which would of course increase the size and bulk and visibility of the second story facing Gray Fox. So we declined to do yet again, another redesign of the second story as he was suggesting. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, next slide. Uh, three out of the five of the neighboring properties on Gray Fox Street are two story and 13 out of 23 or 15% of the properties in the surrounding neighborhood are two story homes. So therefore having a two story home is not inconsistent with the neighborhood character. Next slide, please. The project's second story is reduced by 40%. We think that that's a pretty good faith effort on our part to accurately reflect the direction given to us by the city council to go back and redesign the second story. Next slide. The project second story has been revised down from 3,034 square foot to 1,840 square foot. And we have documented that that is the average size of second stories in the area. Next slide, please. So thank you. And by my clock, I retained an extra 40 seconds. So I should have a little over about four and a half minutes left for the rebuttal. I am, by the way, uh, completely available as always for any questions or comments that you have, council members. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Outside of the appellant team, we just have John Stockwell. Okay. Good evening, can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So as the staff report states, the applicants had four fair and impartial hearings each time on the verge of rejection, they're given the courtesy of withdrawing the application and told to reach out to the neighbors and each time they ignored that direction. As a result, they redesigned the portion of the second story that had little to no impact on the light and privacy impact on the neighbors. Yeah, it had an impact on the cars going by and on the school, but not on the neighbors. After their fourth rejection, they were forced to reach out and I did propose a version that gave them 1,803 square feet of second story, but had a dramatic reduction of the impact of this second story square footage on the neighbors. And at the end of the day, this isn't just numbers, this is about the impact of the second story on the neighborhood. 
But I was really hoping this would be the start of a dialogue, but the next day Renika informed me that they were not gonna change the single square foot. Now the code does say the applicant is entitled by right to build a 7,620 square foot home under 18 feet. And any square foot footage above 18 feet is a discretionary request that triggers a site plan review. There's no guarantee you'll be permitted any square footage above 18. And that's how I think the city of Malibu designed it to strongly encourage people to keep their projects under 18 feet, knowing that although developers like second stories because they're cheaper per square foot, they have a much larger impact on privacy, light and views. Doesn't mean you can't build above 18 feet. It just means you have to be prepared for rejection if you have square footage above 18 feet. And our architect, Doug Burge, told us, you know, if we didn't want the possibility of a denial, we should propose a project that was entirely under 18 feet. And if we were gonna propose square footage above 18 feet, then it should be not one square foot more than our neighbors on both sides had, which is what we did. We, we built a 600 square foot, 640 square foot studio, <clears throat> just like the neighboring property did. Now, my understanding is that if this appeal is rejected, the applicant has plans for a single story, 7,600 square foot home, which would I have no issue with. I understand people, especially planning staff, would love to have a mathematical equation that they could use to make a neighborhood character finding but it's precisely because each situation is different that that doesn't exist. There can be a project with 1800 square feet that does no impact on the neighborhood. It's in a gully or a downslope, not visible to neighbors. So it's not a one size fit all approach. <clears throat> and of course the planning commission can overreach. And as the council, you were correct to overturn incorrect neighborhood character findings as you did on the Selfridge project, which was entirely below 18 feet as you did on the Cuthbert fire rebuilt, which had no light or privacy issues and had no neighbors objecting. In fact, they had multiple neighbors speaking in its favor. This project is different. It's real impact on its neighbors and the neighborhood. And as Mikey said, when it was gonna be rejected in the first city council appeal, neighborhood character exists precisely for this project. This is not a dispute between, between neighbors. This is a fight for the character of our neighborhood. This is not a fire rebuild. The bulk of the homes Don showed photos of with larger second stories were approved before Malibu became a city. And it's precisely because of these type of homes that Malibu became a city and decided to take control of its own development. Neighborhood Don, that's yeah. your time. Okay, well, hopefully I can answer some questions if you have any. Thank you, John. Are there any more public speakers? Oh, well, I know, uh, um, that we have time for rebuttal. Don yeah, the, okay. yeah, there's four minutes and 20 seconds. Right. Before we start the clock, uh, could we uh, put my presentation back uh, uh, to where we left off? Thank you very much. Again, for the record, uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Council members, Don Schmitz, on behalf of the applicant, uh, addressing Mr. Stockwell's comments, uh, when it comes to neighborhood character, I realize that total development square footage is uh, is really not the, the issue, I agree, uh, but uh, it is important to note that Mr. Stockwell's uh, total development square footage is significantly more than what we are proposing, and neighborhood character is uh, not something which is defined uh, based upon who permitted it, it's what exists within the neighborhood. And I think council members, it's important to note that nobody's denying the numbers and the square footages that we brought forward, they're accurate. We use very substantive documentation to show that the average square footage of the second stories in the area were 1800 square foot. And we use very accurate data to show that 57% of the homes in the area, 57% were two stories. Next slide, please. Uh, we've, we did these redesigns in good faith. And I'd ask you to take a look at something. Mr. Stockwell indicates that that my clients never wanted to talk with them is simply not true. The original design that our clients aspired to on this property was to put the second story on the eastern side of the property closer to Mr. Stockwell. And the reason for that is they wanted their pool in the backyard to get that westerly sun. They shifted their entire design so that the second story was on the westerly side of the property. So it is set back literally almost the full width of a parcel along Gray Fox away from Mr. Stockwell's property. And it has absolutely no impact to primary view and no substantive impact to shading, which leaves in fact, that this is not just a gripe between two neighbors, neighborhood character and what is the most sensitive design of what is seen from the public right of way. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and so accordingly, pursuant to the direction of this council, we reduced that second story 40% to be consistent with the average size second story within the area. That's exactly what you told us to do. Next slide, please. Uh, we've already gone over this. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So it's important to note that the bulk and the massing of what is being proposed is not inconsistent with what is in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Stockwell has a two-story home. He had a 50%, which required a site plan review. He had a 50% reduction in his front yard setback. Next slide, please. That was also a discretionary review. The average second story in the area is 1,842 square foot. We're consistent with that. Next slide, please. And so I'll, I'll just basically wrap it up with this. Uh, there was a whole lot of questions, by the way, in the written correspondence. There's just not a time with, enough time within this forum to answer all of those. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that this project design is consistent with the myriad number of standards in the local coastal program for impermeable lot coverage calculations, for side yards, for rear yard, for front yard, for making sure that there's no development is required in point two for slopes steeper than four to one. We meet the landscaping requirements, the fencing requirements. We're two, almost 2,000 square foot under the maximum size house. We've been working at this for four years. And since day one, the staff has been comfortable with the design and we've been redesigning and redesigning again to try and make the decision makers happy and to try and make our neighbors happy. At the end of the day, perhaps our next door neighbor is not gonna be completely happy, but we did cut almost in half the second story as he was requesting and as his council directed. So with that, we think it's worthy of the approval that your staff is recommending council members. I'm very grateful for both your time and the staff time and for our neighbor's time that's been put into this. And uh, I am of course available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, so we're back at council. Um, who wants to comment first, comment, ask questions? Nobody? No comments. Bruce reluctantly has comments. Oh, you're you're muted. No, I don't reluctantly have comments and questions. I was kidding. I reluctantly go first. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I do have a question for, for, for. Let me start off by saying, actually, um, I found it shocking that this has taken so long to get to this point. Um, and I really would like to, not necessarily tonight, but I would like to understand how and why that occurred beyond a timeline, because um, this is also an issue, obviously, that plagues residents who are seeking to rebuild homes lost in the Woolsey fire, and the delays are nothing short of a sin. Um, the staff report I found to be very helpful, very helpful to me, um, as well as the, the enclosures in it, the, the, um, the presentation by the appellant. Um, but I will say that I, I found the staff report to be an advocacy piece that says what it can to support the decision being recommended without any real meaningful discussion of what the opposite arguments are. And that troubles me because I have to make a decision as to what, the, you know, we all do, but each of us has to make a decision as to what we think is the right result here. We have to all make findings of fact. And um, I would find it helpful if the presentation that's being made, I understand the presentation by the applicant being an advocacy piece, but I would appreciate if the staff's report would be more objectively balanced and tell me where there might be wiggle room or where it might be wrong. Um, I have a question for Don because I, I, I spent a lot of time going through these papers. Um, I needed to learn the law, so that I'll know hopefully down the line. But I thought when I first read all these, there was an argument being made that the Planning Commission improperly, and I think unconstitutionally was the argument, applied a neighborhood standard analysis, even though according to Don, that doesn't apply here. And I actually, as best I can tell, the neighborhood standard analysis doesn't apply. I, I think that's right, although I could be convinced I'm wrong, but I think that's right. But I didn't see that it was. And I'd like to understand if that's an argument that's being made, that there was a neighborhood standards analysis applied 
wrongfully? So that's my that's my that's my first question to Don. Was did, are you contending that there was a neighborhood standards analysis applied here? Through the chair, uh, Councilman Silverstein. I almost called you Commissioner Silverstein, which would have been a major faux pas. Uh, the comments and statements by the commissioners left no doubt in our minds that they were applying a neighborhood standards, just a basic averaging um, of the total development square footage for houses in the area. We've experienced uh, that being um, overtly stated and deliberated uh, many of times by the previous planning commission. So yes, sir, they were, in our opinion, uh, if you watch the tapes or are able to get your hands on a transcript, they were applying just a rough uh, uh, neighborhood standards averaging um, to the permissibility and appropriateness of the size of the second story. Okay, I, I, I did not see that, and I, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the neighborhood standards analysis would be, but it, I, I would be interested to know whether anyone else on council does believe there needed to be a neighborhood standards analysis and why, but I, I didn't see that. Um, so another question I have, I have a question to Mr. Stockwell, which is that um, you used the words, and, and my ears perked to it, mansionization of the neighborhood. Um, I wonder, as I see it legally, and I could be wrong, but as I see it, the crux of the issue here is the neighborhood character issue. Um, I think pretty much this boils down to can we or can't we make a finding that this does not adversely affect neighborhood character? Obviously, that's my view. That's not necessarily other people's view. Um, and I hear Mr. Stockwell saying that for the most part, the reason it is not within the neighborhood character or that it would adversely affect it is in mansionization of the neighborhood. I would like to understand as, as pointedly as you can in a couple sentences why you say that the council should find that this does adversely affect the character of the neighborhood or actually we have to find we have to be able to say it does not is my understanding. So why is it we should say that this does not adversely affect the character of the neighborhood? Just what's your strongest point? Well, I think, you know, both the staff report and even Don, they lump all homes with a 600 square foot studio above the garage as a second story home. And they categorize the same as a 3000 square foot second story. Um, Point Doom is, very known for having studios above their garage. That doesn't make them have a huge impact on the neighborhood or a mansion. The whole idea of a bulky second story, and in this case, it's a uh, north to south uh, second story, impacts the whole neighborhood and creates this situation where homes that are approved today are looking more and more like the homes that were able to be approved before Malibu became a city and imposed a stricter both neighborhood standards and a site plan review for square footage above 18 feet. And, you know, it's about the impact to the neighborhood. I do contest Don's figures. He, when he calculates second story square footage, he completely excludes all the homes that are single story. I mean, that city council, when they opposed this, they did not say, go back and give us the average of the second story. They said, go back and work with the neighbors and try and come up with a plan that has the least impact on the neighborhood. I don't think this is that plan. Okay, I, thank you. I, 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 I will say I, I have a hard time getting that, boiling that down into a specific argument as to why this is not within the neighborhood character, but maybe others understand it better than I do. I, I, have, a, I have difficulty with that. The, the other, and this is a very specific question I have of Don, is the, I understand there's a technical requirement that the second floor not exceed two thirds of the size of the first floor. And you, you correctly noted that the loggia of the first floor is included in the determination of, in your calculation of the first floor square footage. And I believe the loggia of the second floor is not being included in the calculation of the square footage of the second floor, leaving aside the question of whether that's appropriate. 
what would this be below two thirds on the second floor if the loggia on both floors were included? And would it be below two thirds if the loggia on both floors were excluded? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair, uh, Councilman Silverstein, the answer is yes. So let me give you the numbers. I understand exactly uh, your question. So the original design uh, was uh, con very consistent with the two thirds ratio. The first floor, all in, including everything, was 4,556 square foot. And so uh, the two thirds ratio was the 3,053 square foot. Hey, what, uh, what it was originally doesn't matter. What is it now? Okay, okay, yeah, gotcha. So now, if you were to um, uh, theoretically exclude uh, the loggia on the first floor, which is included in the TDSF, if you're even to theoretically exclude the garage on the first floor, the two thirds ratio would still allow a permissible second story of 2,174 square feet because the reduction uh, or the elimination, even though that's not what the code says, of the uh, ground floor, lo the ground floor loggia, say that three times fast, and the garage would reduce the first floor down to 3,245 square foot. So the two thirds ratio of what would be permissible would be 2,174 square foot. So at 1,800 square foot and change, uh, the second story that we're proposing, even excluding the garage and the loggia on the first floor is still well within the two thirds ratio. Okay, but what if you include the loggia upstairs as well as the loggia downstairs, then what's the ratio? Uh, there is no loggia upstairs. The loggia upstairs is uh, just an open uh, trellis. A loggia is a covered uh, open on sides roof. But the, I may have read the staff report incorrectly, but I believe that the staff report described- Call it a loggia, right. Yeah. Yeah, they so did. You're contesting, that, you're contesting that statement by the staff? Yes, because, well, it's a, it, it may be a matter of semantics, but. But a loggia has uh, always been historically treated as a solid roof okay. open on the sides. I, I said, well, well, I'm, not, I'm not focusing now on the question of whether it should or shouldn't. So forget whatever you call it, the, the, the area that the staff you contend is mistakenly calling the loggia on the second floor. If that square footage were included in the second floor square footage, what would the ratio be to the first floor? Well, I'll tell you, I... I don't have the exact number, but I believe the upstairs trellis area is a couple hundred square foot. You can't possibly not know the answer to that question. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Bruce, I really, uh, Councilman. I really, on the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, Richard, do you know what the size of the, uh, the patio upstairs with the trellis over it is? And we're here and getting that number as well. Sorry, I'm looking at the plans myself. So I would point out that we have uh, close to. Don, my only question, no, wait, uh, my only question is is a mathematical one. I just want to understand if you include the space of what you're what the staff called a loge and you're calling a trellis in the upstairs, what percentage of the square footage of the downstairs is the upstairs? It's a simple mathematical question. Right. Understood. Well, uh, with the uh, uh, application, I think we're waiting for Richard. I think we're waiting for Richard to answer that. Okay. We can come back to Richard if you have other questions. Well, I, this is an important issue, and, 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 I, and I also have it another way, which is I'd like to understand what's the ratio, the two-thirds, does it hit the two-thirds if you exclude the garage and include the space upstairs? I'd like to just understand mathematically where that works out, because then I, I need to know that to decide whether it matters what the upstairs thing is called. You follow me? Understand. So, uh, council member, you would like to have a calculation, no garage, and also a calculation with the garage, if I heard you correctly, uh, with the the square footage of the of the area oh. called the loggia. With the square foot, yes, the area you call a loggia that Don rejects. Got it. Okay, working on that. Does it meet? Does it? I don't even need to know the number. I just need to know does it meet the two thirds requirement? Very good. Let me just confirm it because I don't want to misrepresent it and give you. And I want to make sure it's an accurate statement. So let's keep moving, and we'll come back to that point. 
Fair enough. Okay, uh, th those are the questions I have for this moment. Um, other than, I also have one one procedural question. I just want to make sure because it wasn't stated one way or the other. Um, have there been ex parte communications between the staff in developing its recommendation and anybody on either side of this matter? The staff is, is not a decision maker, so the staff doesn't have anything they would need to disclose as part of this. There wouldn't be any extra evidence they'd be relying on in making a decision. So any contact between staff and them would not be something to be required to be disclosed before the council. Am I not entitled to know the answer to the question? You, sure, right. you, you, can ask the, you can ask the question to staff about their content. I was just pointing out that it's not required as a legal requirement for the due process. Um, due process does okay. not require it to be disclosed here. The, okay, well, the staff has made a recommendation and I'd like to understand in formulating the recommendation what communications they had with either party. Council member, I had uh, communications with uh, Don Schmitz. I was the original planner on this project uh, before Renika Brooks took it over. And at that time I had spoken to Don and also the property owner. I am not certain that I spoke to Mr. Stockwell. That was a number of years ago. As you can see, this thing's a 2017 application. I do know uh, from my understanding that uh, the planner on the project, Renika Brooks, did speak with both sides, as uh, Mr. Stockwell also indicated, and also uh, Mr. Schmitz did. And then also I was at the planning commission hearings as well as the last city council meeting where both of those members, uh, Mr. Stockwell, as well as Mr. Smith's both spoke on it. Okay, thank you. And I just have one, one last procedural question. And, and Trevor, if you if you tell me this one is not relevant, I, I won't ask for an answer. But the question is, does any member of this council have a personal or professional relationship with any party to the appeal or any representative of a party to the appeal such that it could infect, affect their decision making in this? We have a duty to disclose that in our in our disclosures already. So that's not something that goes to staff. That's up to us to disclose. Well, that, that's what I'm, I'm asking you about council members. I'm asking, does any council member have a personal or professional relationship with the with a party or a representative of the party? Uh, Paul? I have a personal or professional relationship with one of the parties. However, I have known Don Schmitz for probably at least 30 years and have worked with him on various issues in the past. I have never received any money from Don Schmitz. I did get a bottle of his wine that he makes. It's pretty good. Uh, and he has spoken to a real estate office I'm at, and he has spoken to most real estate offices in the community. So I'm well aware of who he is, and I've seen him at innumerable city council meetings. I have no further questions other than to wait to find out about the two-thirds calculation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's noted in a small town that we'll probably know people. I've known Don for years. I know John a bit, but none, you know, no barbecues, nothing like that. No, no chatting on Friday nights about sports or anything. Just know them through around the city. No one has received any compensation or or has a type of relationship that would preclude you from being able to have, be fair and impartial in this hearing? That's correct. I'll, I'll just say, if that were the case, I would have already said that. Um, but I've lived in Malibu a long time. You know, Mikey obviously is born and raised. I think Paul and I have lived here around the same amount of time, 43 years. Hey, you got um, me beat. Um, I've lived on Point Doom for uh, this fall. It'll be 25 years. Um, so it's, it's hard to hear these things and not know some or all of the parties. Um, this is my neighborhood. Um, so I, I don't know what else you're looking for. And I, I've been active in the community for many years. So it's, it's I, don't, I don't know how I would not know people. Just to just be clear, I wasn't asking for each member of council to answer the question of what they knew of other people. I was just asking if there was anyone who had a relationship. That's all. No, we would have to disclose that. Absolutely. Or that would be improper. Right, I've, for I've sure. never done this before, so I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, no, that's part of disclosures. We don't do that many land use items, but it's important. 
And uh, I know that from city, I'm from my planning commission days and I'll always make sure to cover that as long as I'm here. So, and, um, and I'll say, if that were the case, I would have recused myself and um, taken a break. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Paul. I just want to touch on on what we're doing here with the the um, massing rule as far as the two thirds ratio for the second story. That that's a rule that was set up to keep us from having boxy houses that are the same size all the way up. So the top being the same size as the bottom. It is thought that it's a more attractive house if if and more sensitive to neighborhoods if the second story is smaller it's visually smaller and that's where that all came from and it really doesn't make any difference if the first floor is garage or house it's it's all mass is what they're looking at can't hear you mikey do you have uh, any uh questions Discussion on the item, Paul. I'm, I'm pretty clear on the on the project and and it meeting the two thirds rule easily, unless you decide to exclude everything that's actually mass, in which case it won't. Okay. Do you have any uh, questions for staff or uh, uh, Don or John on this item? I'm I'm grateful to have had enough time to read this particular file several times. So it's, I'm, I'm pretty clear on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Karen, um, hang on, hang, we'll get back to you, Bruce, I promise. Yeah, this obviously is a, a large and lengthy and detailed staff report. And I'll say the same thing. Um, uh, yeah, it took time to go through this. Um, and Point Doom is, the third neighborhood in Malibu I've lived in, um, and it is a mixed bag of original houses, newer houses, whether they were before cityhood or not, one story, two story. I even know of one three story house on the point. I'm not sure how that got through, but I know it was before cityhood. Um, I, I'm sorry that the statement that um, the applicant was asked to work with the neighbors is in dispute. Uh, I was on the council at the time we heard it uh, in the fall of 2019. Um, but that's, that's, that's it. We, we have a very, very complete staff report here and the presentations tonight as well. So thank you. Okay. Um. I have a question of John. John, can can you jump back on here? Yes, yes, yes. I do. Yeah. So if if I'm understanding correctly from there's there's a lot of letters back and forth, and this has been around a long time. From the massing issue, from your perspective of, of your property, is because much of the ups, the second story runs north and south, correct? If some of it, what you were hoping for, is some of it would come back and run more east to west. Is, is that correct? That's precisely correct. I mean, essentially what happened was it came with the 3,000 square foot, um, the planning commission gave them the opportunity to redesign with the neighbors. They said, no, we're gonna appeal to city council. You said, no, we can't approve it. Go back and work with the neighbors. They, on their own, redesigned it to take out a lot of the street-facing square footage, not the um, not the north-south square footage, which most directly impacts our property and the <clears throat> the Ashwells and anyone who's looking down towards the, you know, from any of the homes higher up. I mean, honestly, the person most impacted, and I'll admit to this, is the sister-in-law of the applicant who lives to the west. And if this were not the sister-in-law, I'm sure they would be crying bloody murder and be even a bigger vocal opponent of it than me. But yes, that's the bulk of where the second story is, is the issue, not the amount of second story. Okay, thank you, John. Don, can you jump back on quickly? Yeah, 
Yes, sir. Hi, Don. Um, so knowing that, why wasn't the house just redesigned to just shove it around a little bit more? I mean, there's a definite case to be made that the frontage on the street was not as big an issue in this case, particularly with the 110 foot frontage house nearby. Why was that considered and why wasn't that an option? Because it seems like we wouldn't be here if it was. A couple of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, the comments that we had received uh, during the planning commission hearing and at the city council hearing spoke towards the issues of impacting neighborhood character uh, from the second story and what was the appropriate size in the second story. And so uh, that translates into that which is visible to the general public or the neighborhood that would see it. And so the bulk and the massing, which was something that we had been admonished early on by both the staff and the planning commission, should be minimized facing the street. The second uh, reason for that was uh, there had been uh, uh, objections by uh, John Stockwell, uh, not my client, Mr. Atwell, uh, that there was uh, proximity to his house from the second story windows. Uh, if you recollect the email that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation back in 2019, he objected to the windows in the tower looking down into his property. And from the bedroom that we had on the easterly side of the tower, it seemed very counterintuitive to us and the uh, fact set from those two aspects to further increase the size of the second story closer to Mr. Stockwell's house and to increase the visibility of the second story from the public viewing area to and along the street. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to do this. John, can you pop back on quickly? I'm trying to treat a Zoom like, a, like we're in person. Yes, here I am. It would seem if, let's say they did bring a room back around like you and I just talked about, it would seem like it would, just in the way the world works, would need a window that would probably be facing your way. Wouldn't that be a lot closer to your house? No, no. The, the real issue are light shading and privacy to into our backyard, into our pool, into that area. The area that faces our driveway um, you know, the street side, this is this is the area that, that we have the least concern about. And it's it's kind of strange because, you know, they talk about, Don talks about the neighborhood as though the neighbors aren't part of the neighborhood and it's just people driving by in the street. Well, I mean, the neighbors are part of the neighborhood. And so the impact on the neighbors is part of the impact of neighborhood character. But honestly, this would all have been solved if when you guys remanded it back and said, talk to the neighbor, if they had just sat down and said, hey, can you, what would you like to see? Here's what we can do. Here's what we can't do. Uh, we can do 5% of what you want. We're going to keep not, that would be fine, but they just designed this without talking to anyone. And that's why we are here. That's why we are where we are today. Tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce. Well, actually, by the way, I mean, I just said, I, it would be great if we could see Don and John when they're speaking, it would be, it's much easier to relate to people when we can. Um, John's last comment, John, can, I, do you contend that the neighborhood character standard mandates conversations with neighbors? Let me see if you can see me. I know you can't start with me, sorry. I, I think as happened in the Cuthbert project, if all the neighbors are in support of the project and you have no neighborhood opposition, it's hard to cite neighborhood character as a reason for denial, as the Planning Commission has done in the past, and you guys have overturned it. Um, you know, like I said, Doug Burge, even when he said, if you're gonna go for any second story square footage, make sure it's no more than your neighbor has, he still said, go to your neighbor, show them the projects, make sure they don't oppose it, because the last thing the Planning Commission, the City Council wants is neighbors. Just because a neighbor opposes it does not mean it violates neighborhood character. But in general, when you have the number of neighbors that have objected to it and who have, as I said, neighbors are part of what make a neighborhood and they're part of the policing of that neighborhood and they're part of determining neighborhood character, probably much more so than planning staff can do. And 
Like I well, said, I mean, John, I, I mean, I, I, I get that people who want to accomplish something which might be objected to often talk to the people that will object because they want to solve the objections and not have controversy because that's a better way to get it approved. Uh, what I'm asking is, because I can't imagine that the finding we're required to make requires or turns in any way, shape, or form on whether someone did or didn't talk to the neighbors. But I, but I'm hearing from you maybe that you think it does, and I might be wrong. No, I'm not, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it does. I'm saying in the past, when there have been no neighbor, neighbor objections and the neighbors are in support of it, that it's hard to find, it's hard to make an adverse neighborhood character finding. In the case of when the neighbors are objecting and saying, we don't feel this has, it, this has an adverse impact on the neighborhood, that plays into a adverse neighborhood character finding. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I have two other questions before I, I, I still need that, that mathematical issue. Don, the, it struck me as odd that the, um, that the permit was being recommended, approved, conditioned on your client providing an indemnity because it seemed to me either your client is entitled to the permit or your client is not entitled to the permit. I could see where if you were asking for a variance, which is discretionary, where the city might say part of our analysis of whether to give it to you would be to require an indemnity. But I don't see anything in the code that mandates an indemnity being provided as a condition to getting something you're entitled to, if you're entitled to it. And I wonder whether your client is waiving any argument that that's not required. Uh, through the chair, Councilman Silverstein, I'm going to exercise very strong discipline and only answer your question. But the other uh, parts of the conversation are very fascinating to me. And if you want to ask me those, I'm available. Uh, in regards to indemnification, um, it's a very sensitive issue. Uh, you're touching on something that has been uh, a very sensitive issue for me for decades. Um, I will tell you that indemnification is uh, the way it's done. And um, uh, we don't like it um, when we're representing projects and processing them, but the, um, uh, the Coastal Commission, different cities and counties, it's, it's sort of de jour in regards to, to get a, a permit, even a completely clean sheets uh, uh, coastal development permit that they uh, require the applicant to indemnify. So uh, in this particular case, I make sure my clients are fully apprised of what it means. And uh, uh, to date, they, uh, they basically make the decision to take their permit and sign the indemnification paperwork. So your, cl your clients consent to the indemnity if they get the permit otherwise? Yes, sir. Okay. The other question, the, la the last question I have, other than the mathematical formula, is actually for counsel. Um, does this for the attorney counsel, C E L S E L, um, does the city council possess the statutory authority to actually grant this permit, or do we have to remand it to the planning commission with a direction to do so if that's our decision? We have the ability to issue it right here. Doesn't okay. need to be remanded. And Richard does have the answer for you on the two thirds rule, I believe. Great. So, council member, to give you an answer to the questions, if you were to add in the 312 square foot trellis, loggia, whichever we may be calling it, if you were to add that to the second floor, the, the new square footage would be 2152. And if you were to calculate that with the existing first floor as proposed, it would be about 900 square feet under the allowable. It would come out to a first floor that, uh, based off of the first floor as it stands today, your allowable is uh, 3,006 square feet. So 2,152 would definitely work. If you were to remove the garage, uh, your first floor would now come out to 3,590. And if you were to multiply that by two thirds, it comes out to 2,369 and a little bit of change there. And once again, the 2152 uh, uh, square footage of the first of the second floor would work out in that instance as well. Thank you. That's great. So, so if you so if you minimize the first floor as most anyone could argue you could, and you maximize the second floor as much as anyone could argue you could, this still fits within the two thirds rule. That is correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay, that's great to know. 
Okay, um, Paul. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt resolution number 21-02 as for, as the uh, the recommended action. Staff's recommendation. Staff recommendation, sorry. No, sir. Excuse me if I may. Uh, that includes the uh, correction the, that the I- correction. That, I wanted to get into that. That includes the correction. Okay. Okay. Do we have a, a second? I will second. Okay. Um, okay. We have a motion and a second. Bruce? Do we have discussion now? Uh, do you have yet? Yeah, do you want to discuss something? I, I would I would like to explain why it is I'm going to vote the way I'm going to vote, because I think the parties are entitled to know that. So um, I don't know if that's something you normally do or not. Yeah, um, I wouldn't make it overly long, but if you can get it to the point. It's not overly long. Um, I'm going to say that this was this was tough. Um, based on everything I've heard, my decision comes down to this. Um, I don't like this project. I can understand and appreciate why the neighbors would not like this project. I wouldn't want it next to my house. Nonetheless, based on the totality of the evidence, I'm persuaded the project does not adversely affect neighborhood character, as that term is used in the code. Because of that, and because the project now does appear to otherwise satisfy all the various legal applicable legal requirements, I don't see that I have any choice but to do, it, but to but to say I approve, I would vote to approve the project, and that's why how I will vote. I can't, however, in good conscience, vote to approve the draft resolution that's been recommended by the city staff. There's far too many assertions in that draft resolution with which I disagree, separate and apart from that the project should be approved. Um, my preference would be to have this brought back with a more narrowly crafted resolution, which doesn't have a provisions in it that are problematic to me. I, I recognize that if three other people vote to do it, that really won't make a difference. But among other things, the draft resolution, the draft resolution identifies what I believe to be an improper legal standard for deciding the matter, which is a, is a substantial evidence standard. And I had a discussion with the city attorney about that. I believe that our task is not to decide that there is substantial evidence to support our findings. Our task is to make findings, and that would be based on a preponderance of the evidence, meaning it's more likely than not. A substantial evidence standard is what is applied by a court when it reviews our findings if they are challenged. And the reason that uh, that standard is applied, and that's a lesser standard than more likely than not, is because the fact finder already went through the painstaking effort of finding more likely than not. I believe it would be reversible error for us to make findings that the substantial evidence supports that. And that's, a, that's among other problems in the resolution. But as I see it, this application turns on neighborhood character, nothing else. The term neighborhood character is undefined in our law. It doesn't provide any bright line rules or standards on which to make a decision. Um, because of that, I believe the proper jurisprudence actually dictates, unfortunately, that substantial deference be granted to the applicant when the standard is going to be applied so as not to violate their legal and constitutional rights. That's not to say there can't ever be a situation where a proposed project will adversely affect neighborhood standards. Clearly there can be. Um, those would be plainly obvious cases, but it seems to me that a legislative solution is needed for this conundrum. I'm hopeful we might be able to fashion an amendment to the code that will put more flesh on the bare bones of the words neighborhood standards because they're just this is neighborhood character. I'm sorry, I, I meant, thank you. I appreciate that correction. I did mean neighborhood character. Thank you. Um, it doesn't need to be a mathematical standard, but I think it needs to have elements like there are in the neighborhood standards discussion. Um, until then, I, I fear that we're going to be required to bend, to lean towards approving projects such as this one, which we may not particularly like and which the neighbors do not like but which do satisfy the letter of the law as it's currently written. And I think that's problematic and I don't think it was intended to be this ambiguous. Um, I'm somewhat hopeful, I'm somewhat hopeful that, that other members of this council will actually disagree with me 
and, and not believe that this is mandated that we require it, but that's where I come out. I, I don't see that I have any choice in this matter because I don't see any evidence sufficient to support me concluding that this does adversely affect the neighborhood character. So that's, that's where I come out and why I come out there. But the resolution itself, I think, has a lot of problematic language in it. And among other things, it says we adopt verbatim every single thing the staff has said in the report. I don't see how we can possibly do that. Thank you. Okay, um, we have a motion and we have a second, and um, I think we need to take a roll call now. We need to move on. Well, is the motion to approve the project or to approve to adopt the resolution? The motion is to approve the project by adopting the resolution. Okay. You want a roll call vote? Yes, please. Mayor Pro Tem Corsanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No, because I do not believe we can adopt the resolution, but I do think we should be approving the project. Mayor Pearson? Okay, that's kind of a problem there. Um, you're voting against a project you think should be approved. Voting so against the resolution. You're voting against what? The resolution. He doesn't, he, he would want to correct the resolution, I believe. So if this motion fails, he would then, I think, probably bring forward a motion suggesting certain edits be brought back um, to the resolution. Paul? Can I, can I ask for a moment if, if Bruce can, I'm looking at the resolution. I believe it's the one we have here. It's Exhibit E. And I'm wondering if you can identify what, what's the problematic element. I can. It'll take me a moment to bring up the email I sent to the city attorney, which goes through it in painstaking detail. And, um, and again, I, I really, I really believe this project needs needs to be approved, ought to be approved, but I also have a difficult time approving the findings in their entirety that are set forth in here. So let me find it. Are we amending the motion? Not yet. Uh, we. I'm trying to understand why he's not, uh, he says he's in favor of it, but he's not in favor of the resolution. He's in favor of the project, but he's not in favor of the resolution. I'm trying to identify the problem with the resolution. I'll tell you what, um, let's, can we take a five minute break since we're gonna need one anyhow while you come up with that so we can come back and make a vote and move on, okay? So I'm gonna ask that we adjourn, I don't know what time it is. God, it's 10 13. Be, be back by before 10 20 so we can get going. Right. So we can try and get to another item here. Okay. Great. Right. 10 20. Yes. Thank okay. you very much. You want to turn off their screen and uh, microphone.
Just Karen, I believe. Karen, are you there? Hello, hello. Bruce, I would say in the to save time, try and hold on. Let's let's wait till we okay. carry back if we can. <laughs> Something squeaked. Karen, Karen. Hello. Okay, Excuse we're me? all. Or I'm gonna just say hello, Mr. Mayor. We uh we had a motion and a second, and then we had discussion here, and I believe the question to uh, Councilmember Silverstein was if he um. You know what were the changes that he would recommend for the resolution? Hey, do you want me to answer it, Mikey? You did want to say something about brevity. I just want to say, um, I mean, these were some big issues that you raised. I think in the to move things along, if we can try and get as many of your items, questions answered in advance on items like this, it's really helpful. So we can did. get to more items. So. I, 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 I did. I raised many issues with the city attorney and I'm down to these because a lot of them were resolved and cleared away. Okay. So, um, I mean, and, and if you want to just vote three to one to approve the resolution, I'm okay with that. But I, I, no, no, I, I, want, to know I want you to have a good vote. I'm, I'm disturbed with you feeling like you're going to vote one way when you think you should vote another. That doesn't feel right. Okay. Well, to explain it again, and I'll, and I'll go through the detail, the reason I, I, I believe that this project does satisfy the code. I also believe that the resolution that's been presented to us for approval has statements in it that I can't in good conscience find. So the question was, what are they? Section three, findings for granting the appeal. There are two things in that finding that are problematic to me. One is it says that we make the following finding of fact and find that substantial evidence in the record supports the required findings for approval of the project. I, I'd be happy to have the city attorney talk about this, but I believe that is actually an improper legal standard and, and that we need to simply find that the project, that, that the record supports the required finding. When we put in the words substantial evidence, we are actually stating that we use the wrong standard. The second thing is that same provision adopts all analysis, all findings of fact, all conclusions set forth by the staff in the agenda report and the August 3, 2020 Planning Commission staff report. I don't believe I can find that every single thing set forth in those pieces of paper is accurate, and I don't believe we need to. The next thing is, finding B includes the following, 
The siting and massing of the project is consistent with the character of the other homes in the neighborhood and its design reduces the impacts associated with the additional height. It then goes on to say that it doesn't adversely affect neighborhood character. I completely agree that it does not adversely affect neighborhood character, but I don't adopt that rationale for why that's the case. And I don't think we need to in a resolution. And I think we complicate what we find by saying those things. Sec item A2 of section five says there's no evidence, it says the words, no evidence, that an alternative project would, be subst would substantially lessen any potential significant adverse impact of the development on the environment. I agree that an alternative project would not substantially lessen any potential significant adverse impact on the development of the environment. But I can't in good conscience say there's no evidence to the contrary. There's some evidence, but it's insufficient to cause me to find otherwise. Item B4 of section five says the proposed project complies with all applicable requirements of state and local law. We don't, I don't know if we need to make that finding but I don't know that it satisfies every possible requirement of state and local law. I know that it doesn't violate the ones that have been identified as being applicable, and I'm willing to say that, but I can't say that there's no law that we haven't been presented with that this doesn't violate. Item B4 of section five states that the proposed residence incorporates siting and design measures to minimize visual impacts and landform alteration. I don't see how we can say that it minimizes that when there clearly are less maximal alternatives, but I do believe that this is sufficient under the law, but it's not the minimal that's permissible under the law. Lastly, item eight of section seven provides, and this is not a finding, but it sets forth conditions that questions of intent or interpretation of any condition of approval will be resolved by the planning director and it also says that minor alterations can be approved by the planning director. And I asked the city attorney whether neighbors would receive notification of any alterations so that they would have an opportunity to object to them. And I'm told, no, they wouldn't. And I believe it would be appropriate to include a requirement that neighbors be told that the project is being altered. So those are the reasons that I don't believe that, that I cannot support the resolution. And I also believe if those changes were made, it would not affect the fact that we approve the project. If you disagree with me, that's your prerogative, but that's why I can't approve the resolution. Okay, that's a lot. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna get through the next item then. Um, I'm recused for the next one. You'll get through it in flying time. Perfect, roll call then, let's move. Let's move forward for now. I don't have any way to resolve your issues. I didn't realize they're so extensive. And I raised them all with the city attorney in advance and I couldn't raise them with anyone else on council because of the Brown Act, just so okay. you know. We could have with one other person. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No. Mayor Pearson? And I'm going to do something I rarely do. Uh, I find this project very, it's all about communication and an absolute lack of communication is what's caused this, in my opinion. I think there's no winners and no losers. Um, I feel like I've been involved in this project for too long of a time. And at, at this time, after thinking about it, I'm gonna abstain my vote. Um, and I think it's, yes, Trevor? We need to, to adopt the resolution. We need a majority of the, of the, the of the council to vote on it, major of the members of the council. So we would need three votes to adopt the resolution. So I, I would ask you to reconsider abstaining from the, the project and to make a make a decision on this project. Um, the alternative is then to adopt it by minute order. I don't know what that means. What's minute order mean? If we're able to make an order, but we wouldn't be adopting this resolution, we'd be directing um, we were directing that the actions listed in the resolution be um, enacted and they, that can be approved by less than a majority of the council. But to adopt a resolution, we do need three of the five council members to vote for it. Yes, Bruce. Well, if you feel uncomfortable voting one way or the other, I would vote to support what Trevor just said, the minute order. That, like I said, I support the project being approved. I just don't support this resolution. Okay, how do we do the minute order? 
the minute order would would include the same conditions as the resolution that would be the direction do you need a motion for a minute order yes Wait, i don't think i've ever seen one in yeah me neither you're first <laughs> i think we have done it before here um but it is, it is very rare so you know it this is a you know uh, Mayor Mayor Pearson, this is an item where you know if you you know if you have concerns about it, you know, or more information or more discussion would help you in it. But um, you know, I would ask you if if you can to make a decision on you know one way or the other on the on the item. Okay, then I vote no. Okay, then we need regrettably, another. regrettably. I find this a very difficult item. I don't. I don't like having to vote no on this item. Yeah. I'm going to need another motion. That that motion failed. Paul, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this in in the form of a minute order. In the and minute order. Go ahead. I, I don't know how to how to ask for a minute order, Trevor. So if you could please instruct me, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, the, I believe the motion would be to adopt a minute order that. Um, that reflects the the actions directed in the resolution and making the findings um, delineated in the resolution. So you're saying that the minute order will incorporate every single finding in the resolution. It's not just an order that the project is to be approved. No, we we need to have written findings for the decision. So it needs to adopt that. We need to include. But, we need to include that. We need. We need to include the findings that are being adopted. You know, to support the action made by the council. So, for example, is one of those findings that there is substantial evidence in the record to support the finding? Yeah, the motion would be to, to, uh, yes. Okay. You, know, you can make that the record. You can ask for a friendly remit, amendment to. You know, remove that language so that it just says that. Um, I can pull it up. That is well. There were there were a number of them. I mean, it was. I think it's it's been made clear to me by others. Maybe I'm wrong that that no one else is inclined to agree to any of these changes. So I'm not going to waste time proposing a friendly amendment because it'll just be turned down. Okay. So so then. Uh, Mayor Patan Grisante, I, I believe the motion would be to adopt a, a minute order that reflects the actions and the conditions um, and the and as laid out in the resolution, but adopted in the form of a minute order rather than as a resolution. Would that be your motion? Let's try it. Yeah. Do we have a second? No second. I have a motion if that fails. Okay. Now, you're going to second the minute order? No. I guess not. Okay, I will second. Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No, for the same reason that I couldn't approve the findings the first time. Mayor Pearson? No. So that that will fail also since that's that's a tie vote. If, if you abstain from this one, then it. The, the oh, next. yes, that's actually what I meant to do. Sorry, it's getting late already. I meant to abstain from the vote. I apologize. Okay. Can we? Uh, Can we recognize <laughs> Bruce. Did that pass or fail? Can we? Can we take the vote again on this one? Yeah, I apologize. I'm good. I'll get my act together. It's getting late. This has been going too long. May the mayor pro tem to adopt the the actions in the resolution, actions of findings in the resolution as a, a minute order rather than as a resolution. And there was a second from council member Fair. Is that correct? That is correct. Mayor Mayor Pearson, if I could jump in, we need written findings, one way or the other, for a decision. The findings have to be in writing. Per a case called the Panga Scenic Association. The name escapes me. So, I, you know, I would suggest that if if we cannot get a motion, I, you know, I appreciate the, the concept of a minute order. I think that could be done in certain circumstance, certain 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 circumstances. But I think here with the land use application, I think we need written findings. So, if we cannot come to an agreement on written findings, I would direct staff to go back 
and look at the, the findings uh, um, in, the, in the light that Councilmember Silverstein has raised and bring this back. If you want us to, if you want us to give staff specific directions so we can bring back findings that can be approved by a majority of the council, um, I think that's probably the better way to go. Um, again, I appreciate the concept of a minute action, but again, findings in this context have to be in writing and, and therefore I would urge you to. Um, we can't adopt a written minute in order. Well, I, again, I, I, I would urge the council to take, or to, to bring back a resolution that can be approved by at least three council members, such that we have a written resolution documenting the action. Um, council That's, member Silverstein. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say it again, I, the project itself satisfies the law as I see it. I believe there are as a way to write these findings in a way that they satisfy me in my ability to approve them and which would be consistent with the law. I do not, I'm not in any way seeking to hold up this project. I think it's been going on for way too long already, but by the same token, I cannot approve of a finding that I don't agree with. And if it's amended, I'll, I'll pass it with flying colors and you'll have my vote as well. We could we could bring the action back with the with with both options with a with a resolution that addresses Councilmember Silverstein's comments, also with a, a written minute order that reflects the resolution as it is now, and then the, the council could make a, a choice between them. Okay, um, let's let's move forward and bring it back. I'm I'm not married to. I'm not married to the language either way, to be honest. Um, I think we know what the project's about and how we move this forward is what I'm interested in. Um, you're the lawyer, so I would take your, you're the attorney on this, so I would accept your advice. Okay, then can we get a motion that we bring this back with a resolution that addresses the comments raised by Council Member Silverstein, and also bring alternatively a minute, a written minute order that reflects the language currently in the um, the proposed resolution. So moved. Okay, I'll second. I'm not sure why we're doing both. If uh, we only need one, but um, I'll accept that for now. And let's do roll call so we can move on. We need a second. I seconded it. Oh, I'm sorry. All we're doing right now is voting to bring back two alternatives to be voted on? Yeah, right. one with your language and one with the minute order. Okay. Okay. Can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Versanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I would apologize I would, to the public that went on too long. Um, yes. Mayor? I'd also uh, caution the council that uh, I'd ask the council not to have any contact further on this item since we've conducted the public hearing so we can bring this back just for resolution um, or adoption of the minute order. Um, so we don't need to reopen the public hearing. So I would ask everyone not to have further contact or discussion on this item. Okay, uh, I would agree with that. Okay, now we're on to 4B. Appeal number 2 uh, 20 008, Appeal Planning Commission Resolution number 20 58 at 5936 Valeri Height Avenue. Um, I believe, Bruce, you said you had to uh, recuse yourself on this? I do. So I will depart the meeting. Okay. Uh, now, has someone let Steve know he's also recused on this, I gather, or not? My understanding is he's also recused on this item as well. He participated at the Planning Commission level. Okay, does he need to come back to recuse himself or can he just stay gone? He's not in attendance at, at the meeting here, so. Okay, but it's okay that he doesn't come back and we just go forward without him? Yes. Okay, so just I, I need to physically log out of this Zoom meeting now, right? That's Could cool. I ask one question? Um, or can we ask why Council Member Silverstein is recusing himself from this item? Yes. One of the parties is a very good friend of mine, and I have intimate knowledge of that party's views and had many discussions with that party before I was even elected to council. And Thank I think it would be unfair to the other parties if I participated because of that. Thank you. Thank Welcome. You. Sure. 
Bye, bye all. Okay, can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor Pearson and members of the council. What you have before you this evening is an appeal of a administrative plan review that's related to a Woolsey fire affected parcel. And the point of contention in this particular application is a site plan review for an addition to the second floor as well as the relocation of that second floor. If I may have the next slide, please. This is an aerial photo in the vicinity map of the subject property. It's located in the Malibu Park neighborhood behind Malibu High School. You can see the ball field uh, and tennis court area in to the right of that photograph and the property that we're talking about this afternoon or evening is in blue. That property prior to the fire was developed with roughly a 3,500 square foot single family residence as well as a 965 square foot second unit. And there was a 700 square foot detached garage as well as an accessory building that was a greenhouse or hobby room area that was 720 square feet. In September 2019, staff approved a planning verification application uh, for the rebuild of the replacement structure, uh, the second unit and the greenhouse, which were all lost in the fire. Next slide, please. These are photographs of the story poles that were put up for the, uh, at the project when it was first reviewed by the planning department. The applicant had originally proposed to put back the structure within the like for like plus 10% allowance. However, as they were developing their plans after they received their planning department approval, they were working through the plan check phase in building and safety, getting their engineered drawings completed. At that time, the fire department had an issue with the proposed turnaround and access to the property. As a result of that, the applicant had to redesign their proposed structure and the garage was relocated and it was placed under the existing or the proposed residence, proposed replacement structure. The issue was that where the garage had to go to meet the fire department requirements was under two floors. Uh, there was the ground floor as well as the replacement second floor. Because of the topography of the site and attempts to minimize grading, and also just to the physical topography in relation to the fire department turnarounds and access requirements, it was not possible for that garage to be considered a subterranean uh, structure and therefore excluded from TDSF and the how we count the stories on a property. And since the code requires that no home in Malibu be no more than two floors, uh, to make this work, the applicant then had to relocate the second floor from the west end of the property, the Ventura side of the property, over towards the Santa Monica side of the property. And it's that relocation that has uh, essentially caused this appeal. May I have the next slide, please? As proposed, the applicant is proposing a replacement structure that is actually slightly smaller than the 10% allowable. A, an administrative plan review with the site plan review was review, uh, submitted to the city and approved by the planning department for a 270 foot square foot, 274 square foot addition to the uh, second floor that was there prior to the fire. And the total TDSF for the project, including the underground garage, is about a 5,600 square foot replacement structure. The swimming pool will be relocated. There's a new swimming pool deck a driveway and grading. And then also the site plan review that, as we mentioned, is the subject of this appeal. This property, as project, as I alluded to a bit earlier, was first approved by the planning department because it was a administrative plan review with the site plan review. It was a director level decision. That decision was subsequently appealed to the planning commission. The planning commission decision uh, has now been appealed to the city council. May I have the next slide, please? 
This is a site plan showing the proposed development on the site. And as you can see in this, you can see the pool location, the fire department turnaround, and the access to the home there with the new driveway coming off that curve in the driveway. Next slide, please. The purpose of this slide is to show the previously existing developments footprint as well as the proposed developments footprint. The bottom of this photograph of this drawing is the south, the part of the home that faces towards Malibu High School or the Pacific Ocean. And the neighbor that is the subject of this appeal would actually be to the top of the screen, to the north of the property there. And what you can see in this photo in this drawing here is that the the gray striped area is the footprint of the old home. The non-striped area is the footprint of the proposed house that's outside the footprint of the old home. And the overlap is the white area. And once again, it is the area that would be to the right of the screen. Uh, that new area there where the addition to the second floor is proposed. You may have the next slide, please. The appeal that was submitted to the city contends that the relocation and addition to the second floor is not a like for like project. That the appellant was deprived of her abilities to protect her view because this was permitted as essentially a expedited or fire rebuild type permit. And the appellant also contends that relocating and increasing the size of the second floor has impacts on the appellant's primary view. The some things to point out here are that in the code, uh, the word like for like is not used in the fire rebuild exemption. The fire rebuild exemption states that the replacement structure shall be generally located within the or on the same building pad as the original structure that it's replacing and that the intensity of that structure isn't uh, changed. And that's in local implementation plan section 13.4.6. So in this, as staff has presented to the uh, planning commission and also in our notice of decision, this project did qualify for an exemption from a coastal development permit and qualify for an APR because of the fact that it is cited generally on the same building pad. The footprint is generally the same. In addition, the local implementation plan allows for an exemption of up to a 10% addition to the house. And in this case, the owner is not pursuing that much of an addition. It is slightly less. As for the denial of the appellant's abilities to protect her views, uh, that statement is also inaccurate because regardless if this was a coastal development permit or uh, any other type of decision with a site plan review involved, there would be a public notice period, which did take place. There was a 21 day public notice and staff did go out and look at primary views from a number of properties, including those that had uh, primary views on file. So the uh, uh, no opportunities were lost. In fact, the appellant, uh, the appellant actually gained an additional opportunity uh, because they were able to appeal it to two bodies rather than just one. If I may have the next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the relation of the appellant's property in blue to the subject property in red. The appellant's property does look over this property and towards the Pacific Ocean. Next slide, please. When it comes to primary view determinations, the council uh, passed ordinance 450 which affects the ability of someone to claim a primary view in disaster areas. Specifically, the purpose of this ordinance was to not be able to claim a new view uh, that would unduly restrict somebody who is building a replacement structure, which this meets the criteria of the exemption to be considered a replacement structure. And it allows someone to put back that structure and as well as landscaping. In addition, the appellant is also uh, claiming a primary view on a structure that is actually under construction. The structure on the appellant site, as stated in the staff report, is not the original residence. Prior to the fire, 
the appellant had started construction on replacing the existing single-story house with a much larger two-story home. That two-story home will look over this property. However, that home has never been completed or a certificate of occupancy issued. The code has a very strict criteria of how one defines a primary view, and part of that definition is that staff needs a the structure to be complete and also occupied, so a certificate of occupancy, so that we're able to go out and evaluate a primary view from the specification as defined in the code. Uh, staff was unable to do this prior to the fire and also after the fire as just a response to look at if this would have some sort of view as well, just to see if there was something there. Uh, but as I mentioned, with uh, considering Ordinance 450, which requires you to have a primary view prior to the fire, and also the fact that this is a structure that is under construction and it, it, at no point has been completed to where a primary view could be assessed, uh, staff is unable to make a determination if there is a primary view involved in this situation. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the council adopt resolution 21-03, denying the appeal and approving the administrative plan review, as well as the associated site plan review for that addition to the second floor. Staff is available for any questions as well as the property owner. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, let's have disclosures. Um, Karen? No disclosures, no site visit. Okay, Paul? I, I have received Paul. communication as we all have. It's in the public record. Okay, great, thank you. Paul? When this was noticed, the uh, the couple with the house that's being appealed uh, sent me a message. Uh, apparently they sent a message to everyone offering them uh, a meeting on the property. I accepted, uh, it was for a Saturday at 11.30. Uh, apparently, after I had left for my first appointment at the day, they sent out an email canceling. So I went to the property, there was nobody there. It was vacant, I walked around, I looked at the story poles that were there, I looked back at the other properties, identified the neighboring properties, and, uh, and I left. Uh, subsequent to that, I received an invitation, as I'm sure some of you did as well, from the appellant uh, to visit her property. And uh, further a call from Terry Lukoff, who owns a property directly to the east, uh, saying he would meet me because uh, Stacy and her husband were not well. Uh, so I said, okay, uh, met them at the property. With Terry, I was able to go and stand next to their deck, the first floor and look over the property and look at the, uh, the story poles that are there. Uh, Terry informed me and the emails I had received informed me that they, uh, that they actually should be 39 feet apart, but you know, I got a good idea of where they are and how this site works. Terry also apparently uh, was, uh, I don't know that he's the appellant, but he, he filed an objection for his view. And so we went to his house and stood on the, on the slab from it and then the gentleman on the next house over to the to the uh, ocean, actually between the ocean and the house that we're talking about today, uh, who is going to be building a second story, uh, told me he was uh, opposed to it. So I thanked them and uh, left. Okay, did you learn anything? Uh not in the staff report or that you need to share on your visit? I got a really good feel of how far the house is from, from the house behind and what the terrain is like between this house that we're talking about and the Lukoff residence. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I 
visited the property at the request of the um, uh, the crest of the appellant and uh, several months ago. Um, Mr. Lukoff was there too. Clooney Rosses were there. Got uh, a view of of, uh, of what they perceived as their issues at the time. Um, then I got an invitation from the Dankers and visited last weekend. Um, I um, got their perspective from from their property and a bunch of mud on my shoes, but that's okay. Um, I've known, I think, everyone but Mr. Dankers I met, but everyone else I've known for quite a while, but not overly closely, not on social terms, really. Um, I learned, I was able to put perspective to what the plans clearly show, but seeing it in person um, always makes it much more clear to my understanding. So I benefited from visiting the location, I believe. Um, got a much better understanding of it, and I believe that is my disclosure. Yes, Paul. Can I add something? Yes, of course, please. Uh, during the uh, when I was with Coldwell Banker, I worked with Terry Lukoff for probably 25 years. Uh, during the, my office moved and I moved into Pinnacle. And during the course of this, about last week, I discovered that Mrs. Denker's license is hanging at Pinnacle, although I don't know who she is. So with, with COVID, we, we haven't interacted, so. And I, I don't have any trouble with the idea that I can give a fair discussion here. Perfect, and I feel the same way too. Thank you very much. Okay, we have public speakers. Are we have speakers? I should say. Oh, yeah, we have the appellate team. Stacy Clooney's Ross. Uh, I'm not sure she wants to share her time with anyone, but we'll go ahead and unmute. Stacey. Great. Hi, good evening, council members. This is actually Craig Clooney's Ross, Stacey's husband. I'm going to speak tonight if that's acceptable for you guys. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so uh, my wife Stacey and I are, are in fact building the house at 29958 Harvester Road. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet tonight for everyone's sake, given that we're already at a late hour. Um, being that we did not need to speak, to seek legal counsel in this situation, I'm going to speak from the heart. However, having just listened to Don Schmidt's spectacular presentation, I'm starting to question that decision. Uh, I will start by addressing some points made by Richard Carter, the Denker's lawyer. He uses some very strong language, which we find to be offensive, untrue and insulting to our character. Words like attacking and sword are used. I would also like to clarify that it has never been our intention to delay the, their project to, the, to their financial detriment and emotional well being. Mr. Clark contends that we are trying to drag this out long enough so that we can complete our project and then apply for a PVD. The funny thing is that we had no idea that was even a possible tactic until. John Marza brought it up as a hypothetical at the last appeal. It is now being asserted by Mr. Clark that we are trying to stall the Danker's disaster rebuild until we can create such a right, which is absolutely untrue. Uh, you know, the whole point of, of this appeal for us has nothing to do with PVD because we're well aware of the fact that this, this is a new house and that the view is different. Uh, Mr. Clark also asserts that we had no ocean view prior to the Wolsey fire. Obviously, he has never been on our property and neither have the Dankers. They have never visited our original house that burned down. There absolutely was and still is an ocean view. When we designed our new house six years ago, we faced it in a direction 
that afforded us the best ocean view, which was clearly visible standing at what would be the height of our second story. With the Dankers flipping the footprint of their house and adding an additional four feet to the second level, that now places it directly in that corridor. Mr. Clark refers to Ordinance 450 and contends that the Dankers rebuild is in the same location as their destroyed structure and is in the same relative, not identical size. At the heart of the matter here is what really defines like for like. This was certainly brought to question by Steve Euring and John Marzer at the last appeal. It is simply our belief that flipping the footprint, adding a basement and, a f and four feet of additional vertical to the second level is not like for like. The letter of the law is, as it currently is written, is ambiguous. I mean, as was pointed out in that diagram, the, the addition on that said, yes, it is close to the footprint, but the, the second level on, on the new one is clearly going further out than what the original house was. We believe the city is now at a crossroads where if this type of change to a structure is considered like for like, then it will open the floodgates to other people to make dramatic changes to their new structures based on it being like for like. Mr. Clark also contends that we are attacking the height and reconfiguration on the second story of the Danker rebuild. That is both outrageous and completely untrue. He further goes on to say that we badly assert that the Dankers decided to materially alter the structure of their burned home in order to provide themselves with what they believe can be a better view. How exactly would we know this, he asks. We can clearly see from our property what the view is from both sides of their house. There is a huge coral tree as well as a pine tree on the property below them, directly in front of the view of where their old second story used to be. Any council member who was on our property would have seen that. Also, why would they go up an additional four vertical feet on the second story if it didn't afford them a better view? Hardly a rhetorical question, I think. I would also like to point out, as has been mentioned, that two other neighbors who were at the last appeal also objected to this reconfiguration and additional height. We just happened to be the ones most affected by it. It's disappointing that the council members who recently visited our site did not see the complete structure of the Danker project as half the story poles have been blowing down in recent winds. We have always made the best effort to get along with all our neighbors. And when we did meet with the Dankers to try and come to some middle ground, Jennifer Danker was, was not open to any such conversation and further went on to say that our new house was an eyesore that both she and her friends hated and that once complete, she would be planting the tallest trees possible along the fence line between our properties to restrict our view. The interesting thing is at the end of 2017, well before the Wolsey fire, the Dankers were only too happy to accept our neighbours above us on Harvester, Patrick Massett's offer at his own expense of $20,000 to take down a row of their giant 50 foot eucalyptus trees along the property line dividing our properties. This was done to improve Patrick's view and by default it greatly improved our ocean view as well. So it's in your hands as a city council to set a president and define exactly what is like for like and if you don't, it will create a lot of ambiguity in the like for like rule and will lead to all sorts of problems for hundreds of structures that have not yet been rebuilt. Our contention is simple. The Dankers, what the Dankers are doing is not a like for like rebuild. This is not personal at all. We are simply trying to make sure that the correct precedent is set on a like for like rebuild. We will happily accept whatever the outcome of this appeal is. We all lost a lot on that day in November 2018 and would like to move forward with both clarity and serenity. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Okay, and next we have Jen Dinker. Okay. Hi. Hi, I can hear you. Hey, 
I, I believe we're playing a slideshow right now in lieu of speaking. Oh, okay. Go. Go. I can't reach it. Oh, I got it. Why not? Jump far. Dude, Jump. You can do it. Okay. Do we have any other public speakers on this item?
Yeah, I just wanted to make sure Jen was done. Um, Mikey, can you can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jen. Um, so I, I actually, um, I don't want to say too much. I agree with the decision of the planning department. We did our due diligence in the very, very beginning of all of this, right after the fire. Um, and I, I only just want to speak to one thing about the trees in the back of the property as far as what Craig said. He was building with the CDP and, um, and we had a conversation about the eucalyptus in the back and how he was only able to build six feet. We can only see his house from the very back of our property. But we did agree that I would be the one or we would be the ones to put up the taller landscape so we did not see his home. It was not to block his view because truly you can see just from our video what our property looked like before and what it looks like now. So that's all I'm gonna say for now and we'll reserve the rest in case we have to come back, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay, okay. And are there other public speakers? Um, we have Terry Lukoff and Richard Carter okay. and Robert Brinkman signed up to speak. Okay. So Terry Lukoff. Hi, it's Terry. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Terry. I'd like to make one comment before I start, which is I wish you would start these meetings at 5 p.m. because it just gets really late for older people to have to stay up and do this. Okay, so that was my comment. As you could see from the Danker slideshow, they had a beautiful property. They showed you continually their one-story dwellings, one-story here, one-story there and a property that was fully vegetated. But this is not what they're proposing to build now. They took, which was a detached garage that you saw, and instead of keeping it on the ground floor to, so they could increase the size of their house, they put the garage subterranean. That made, since you can only have two stories, they had to move to second story. So they moved the second story from the west side to the east side. This house that they're building now might be similar in footprint, but it's definitely not like for like. They've raised the ceiling where they used to have a 22 foot ceiling and it, it was like a, a upstairs den that now it's a 274 square foot added onto the second floor with a 24 foot ceiling and it's a whole master bedroom. This totally looks down on both my property, Brinkman's property, and blocks the view of the uh, Cooney, Ross, and Craig's and Stacy's property. It also is going to impact the sunlight that is able to come onto my property. It's going to impact my privacy and the, the neighborhood character is going to be changed because they will have changed the area that has mostly one story houses except for the Brinkman house, which was two stories prior to cityhood in into a two story Colossus overlooking my property, taking away all of my privacy. The mission of the city is to preserve neighborhood character. The mission of the city is to keep our area looking rural. Yet what the Dankers are proposing belongs in a more metropolitan suburb. Now I going to have them constantly looking down on my property and all the beautiful landscaping that they just showed you on their property that kept our property separate, kept our properties beautiful and kept us as good neighbors is going to be destroyed because they're going to be up there. They're Terry. Going to monolith. Yes, ma'am. That, that's your time. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Next, we'll hear from Richard Carter. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Richard. Good evening and, and thank you. Um, I represent the Denkers. Uh, I have nothing to add other than that Mr. Lukoff um, did not file an appeal. Oh, we had the opportunity to do so. And that the, we believe that the Planning Commission's resolution should be adopted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Robert Brinkman. Okay. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I would like to speak in support of Ms. Clooney's Ross. I'm also a neighbor, as you've heard. My view is not directly affected. Um, I'm sad that I have to do this because I feel very friendly towards the Denkers, and I know that uh, this probably won't get reciprocated. Um, I wish there were more communication, and I noticed that you, Mr. Mayor, said about the previous case, that uh, a lot of this could be avoided with communication. There was absolutely no communication between the Denkers and any of the neighbors. We were presented with completed plans, and uh, when we tried to address it with them before this was ever appealed or brought up to the city, we were roundly and soundly rejected. <clears throat> the uh, staff report... Um, argues for this rebuild. It's really an advocacy piece. Um, they bring up lots of arguments, uh, including the fact that this is a like-for-like -like rebuild. They point out that it doesn't add quite the 10% that are allowable, but in fact, the uh, main structure from what was there before to what is going to be rebuilt is increasing from what I understand from reading the report from 4,010 square feet to 5,608, which is in fact a 40% increase. It's just if you take in all the other separate structures they had on their property before and add them all in, that then you can say, yes, they're not taking the full 10% increase, but, but the actual main structure of the house is increasing considerably. Also, it's, it's going up in height from 20 feet and two inches to 24 inches. And it's increasing the second story. I, as was pointed out, had a second story myself. Um, it is going down in height from what it was from 27 feet, I believe, to now 22. It's also shrinking. Um, I did that to try and stay within the in-kind rebuild guidelines. I didn't know that you can move your second story completely out of the envelope where it was, raise it, add to it and still have it count as part of an in-kind rebuild. I wish I had known that because I would have designed my house very differently. Um, furthermore, um, it said that this shouldn't affect Miss Clooney's Ross view because she didn't have a house and it didn't have a certificate of occupancy, but in fact, she was a fire victim as well, only she's not being treated as one. She was ready to build, she had started building and it was delayed by the fire and now She's being treated as a person who didn't have a house when, in fact, she would have had one if there weren't a fire. So the fire affected her as well as her neighbor. Um, I have more, but I'm at the end of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're just back around to the appellant. Okay. Um, Craig or Stacey, do you wish to uh, say anything else with your remaining time? Yeah. I mean, look, I'd like to just reiterate, you know, what Mr. Brinkman said, look, we lost everything on two properties side by side. You know, we lost, and it wasn't just the house we were living in on this particular property. We lost a 2000 square foot barn building and the property next door, we lost a main house and other structures. Um, along with all the vegetation, especially on the second property. So, you know, um, we, while, while we were, while this is not a fire rebuild, we designed this house specifically with what view there was to be had. And that's what is being impacted. And we did not have a fire rebuild 
and by it were it not for the fire we would have been finished with this house and probably had a certificate of occupancy so you know um as i've stated while it's clearly never been our prerogative to try and delay this out and and cause the dankers any kind of um uh emotional grief or financial or any kind of strife you know we're just battling battling this based on what it is which is the increase of the, the changing of where the second story is and the increase of size and height and that is really the heart of the matter for us and nothing more so thank you all right thank you thank you both okay um i think that's all of public Testimony, correct? Um, thinkers get to go again. Oh, I apologize. Did Dankers like to speak? Um, they haven't. Oh, wait, here they are. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I was speaking. I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, okay. So first, I'd like to point out that we did try to rebuild per the original everything. We did everything in our power. It was the fire department. We did not choose to have to relocate our driveway. Believe me. The expense attached to everything that we've had to do in our new foundation to put the garage underground is huge. And um, I'd also like to point out that Stacy and Craig, I have photos from right after the fire. They had not started building at the point of the fire. Um, so that's untrue. We're also at 23 feet in height, not 24. And I believe that Craig and Stacy have 3,000 square feet on their second story at 28 feet. Um, and I'd also like to point out that all of our neighboring homes, except for the Doran house, which is the one that Robert Brinkman is fighting, has a second story of some kind. I believe that Terry Lukoff wanted one, but I believe he's going to just put his house at 18 feet, which I'm sure he'll have fights from the neighbors as well on. So that's all I've got. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're back here at the council, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Karen, Paul, who would like to speak? Paul? Uh, I read through the agenda report a couple of times, three times actually. And it's fairly clear that uh, there was never a view protection filed for the Clunis Ross property. Uh, it's also clear that because of the ordinance that was passed to protect the right to rebuild, that that is not available to them at this point. Uh, and the, there seems to be some confusion about the views that are protected. The only views that could have been protected are views from the first floor of the house. And if the first floor view was blocked by vegetation that pre-existed your ownership, you had nothing to, to uh, claim. Uh, and there was a, a lot of people worried that because so much vegetation was destroyed that we would end up with a totally different Malibu as a result of everybody moving in to claim views over properties that were now denuded and, and prevent people from having landscaping in the future. Uh, and while I've, I'm feeling like there really is only one thing to do and that's to accept this. It's, it's fairly clear that they tried hard to build a house that didn't have a garage under it or partially under it. And it's, uh, 
I think we need to get some people back in their houses. And the only way we can do that is by giving them permits. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Karen? Yeah, I will say this is this is um, an awkward position to be in, as I said earlier, having lived here as long as I have and knowing almost every party involved in this, um, some more than others, looking at this um, on its face, I realized that the fire department requirements did require uh, a, a redesign, uh, did change the driveway did change the second story. And as Paul was saying about the primary view determination, I guessed um, that right after the fire, the city would receive applications for primary view determination from properties where all of a sudden there was a view where there hadn't been one because of the fire. And that didn't take long to have happen. Um, and that's why we had to pass that um, resolution preventing that. Um, and I, I was sad to see that happen. I was sad to see that people were trying to take advantage of that situation. I'm not saying anybody here is. Um, so I don't have any further comments. Okay. Um, I think I think this situation is a tragedy. I think it's just really unfortunate. I think there's no winners here at all. And it really make it really makes me sad. I think what's clear that I struggle with is a number of things. The Clooney Rosses situated their new house in such a way as to take advantage of the view away from the second story of the Danker's house. By the fire department putting the driveway there and moving it over there, I don't think, you, we, can, we can say whatever codes you want, but I don't think there's any way they could anticipate that. And that they situated their house to anticipate what would be there. And I don't know that as a city, we have a code that anticipated the series of disasters that befell this whole area. Um, I wonder a couple of things. I wonder if there would have been a way to make an exception and improve, if it's done right, the second story over where the garage is, over back where it was, and try and avoid that that three-story condition. I've seen it done, it can be done, so it doesn't look like a three-story condition. Um, I think, I don't think either app, either property did anything wrong here. But you end up with, I, I completely understand why the Colonial Rosses are upset. They started building a house before the fire, or they had plans, and it was clearly focused away from the second story condition. And um, to have a fire rebuild where the second story condition moves over, which I don't view as the Danker's fault, I think that should have been dealt with. I really do. I just think it's at least a really, it's a major change that no one in the neighborhood could anticipate. And I, I know the language on a fire rebuild is, is what it is, but that's a big change to have from having one story in front of you to having two. Um, and I don't, I don't blame the Dankers at all. They're doing what they had to do to rebuild their homes. So I think this is just a total tragedy. Um, I really do. And now it's divided a neighborhood and I think it's sad. I think it, I would have found a way to, if they needed their garage to let them put the second story somehow above it because this situation has just gotten so ugly. And, um, I just feel for everyone in the neighborhood there. And I think we need to think about that. We got a lot more homes being rebuilt and I think it's a really big difference when the second story is not where it was. 
in a neighborhood that can really have a, an impact. I mean, clearly, I mean, the value of homes in Malibu is largely based on where they face in the view. And to have an unanticipated home have a second story in front of you is fairly shocking to me. So, but I don't, I don't blame either side. There's no one at fault here. I think we need to really look at this closely as a city. Um, Cause I don't think the intention was to alter in a neighborhood where there's a bunch of houses that turns out to be ground central for the worst fire in our history. I don't think the intention was to create neighborhood conflict. So I know we're probably past the point where things can be changed and we just have to decide, but there's no winners here. Um, and with that, um, unless there's more discussion, I'll call for a motion and a vote. Or was there a motion already? No. We don't have a motion yet. Okay, thank you. Paul? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to uh, adopt resolution number 21-03, determining the properties category and onward. Staff's recommendation. Staff's recommendation, thank you. Karen, are you gonna second it? I'll second. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Versanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pearson? No. I and I would still hope there's some way to fix this. I know it's probably too late, but I just find it a real tragedy. But that's my feelings. So the motion fails. Oh, because we have to have the three again? Yes. <laughs> That's my vote. I'm... Well, I'm gonna try and talk you out of it. Here's here's what I think. I think that that uh, the original house had a second story that at that point was about 20 feet wide. I think is that correct? Is uh, Richard? Can you can you weigh in on this, please? Sure, let me double check the plans to give you the exact dimension, uh, but you are, in generally speaking, you're correct. It's getting wider. And it's it's currently, I think the proposed is about 30 feet wide. And when I stood on the, on the, uh, next to the deck on the, the Clunas Ross property, I could see where, where it was before and how it moved over to the left. And it's not like they're looking through a tiny thing. They have a very wide view. And so we're moving, this property is, the uh, second story has moved over to the east, I think probably about 40 feet, is that correct? Something like that? Um, at least. Is it more than that? Actually, I'm wrong. It's yes. uh, according to the plans, it's 24, it's 25 feet, six inches wide, 25 feet, four inches wide. That's correct. Okay. And how far over did it move? Can you remind me? Uh, looks to me like it moved over about I think less than 40 feet. Sorry. I, I, I believe that uh, council member Grisante is correct. It's probably in the 35 to 40 foot range is the distance if you were to switch ends. Yeah. And I think that from the, and how far would you say it is between this house that's proposed and the 
Clooney's Ross house that's standing there now. Um, if you could give me a moment. And uh, Council Member Grisanti, are you meant, are you meaning the, the the new house that the Stacy Clunes Ross is building, or the, the distance from the new house that Stacy Clunes Ross is building to the back side of this new house that's proposed for the Denkers? My guess is it's like 250 feet at least. I don't know if that's correct or not. That's pretty close. Just a quick estimate's about, uh, I'd say that from the back of the proposed residence uh, to the area where the new house is getting sited is uh, roughly 230, 240 feet. So there's That's a pretty no small way, included angle. So there's no way to move that second story situation back to where it was. And is it common to move where the second story situation was on a fire rebuild? Because I would think that would be really a big issue if that happened. It it does happen, and that's the reason why a site plan review was processed. Anytime that somebody puts, whether it be within the 10% addition or square footage they had before, anytime that they do that, we don't do it as a planning verification. We process a administrative plan review with a site plan review in the case of a second floor. Uh, but in general, anytime someone steps outside uh, the, the footprint or increases an area that it would be subject to a discretionary review. We do process that. We don't let somebody do this. We're not, uh, sorry, it's getting late. What it I'm is, it's is late. We're not going to, uh, the, the city has made it a policy that if somebody wants to increase their 10% or relocate something into an area that would normally require discretionary approval, we, we require that discretionary approval. Uh, they don't skip uh, that part of the process. So when it went to the planning commission, it was processed with a discretionary approval. That's not what you're saying, is it? Yes, it is. The site plan review is a discretionary request. It's not a, it's exempt from a coastal development permit, but it still requires a site plan review for the part over 18 feet. And the planning commission mm -hmm. approved that situation? Yes, they did. And there's no way, there's no variance where the second story condition can be where, where it originally was? Or was that considered? And why was it, if, if it was considered, why was it not done that way? The, the, the applicant, to, to my knowledge and I can check with the, the staff member I have on, on the call, on the meeting right now. Uh, but they, they went for this route because one, it would avoid a variance. I don't know if they discussed a variance. What would happen is we would need to essentially uh, grant a variance uh, from a prohibition. And, and perhaps Trevor can speak a little more to this. There's a prohibition in the code that says home shall be no greater than two floors. And we would need to process a variance with this. And part of the difficulty here would also be the hardship. And it'd be hard to make findings that you'd find other properties that have this three-story condition that would justify them being granted a variance. You, you have to make those specific findings that they're being denied something that everybody else is having. It may be difficult to do that. And what about having the garage right next to the house? Or why was that not why was that not a possibility? I would recommend we have the the Dankers also speak to that as well. Um, my understanding is I believe that what they were fighting with was an issue of making sure that 
the fire truck could get to a, a point on the property where you would be able to do the 150 foot hose run in each direction. Okay, I didn't read that in the staff report. Paul? The other thing that shows up in the staff report is there's a depiction of the fire department turnaround. Right. And those are pretty darn bulky. And uh, so it chews up a lot of space on that side of the property. And the only way they could have the garage on that side of the property was have it even further away and closer to the Clunis Ross property than, than it was originally. And I don't know if that was even considered, but it would be, it'd be a strange configuration to have, to have they, I think each leg of a fire department turnaround is like 75 feet. Is that about right? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty big. I know so that. you'd have your garage 150 feet from your house. All right. I just, I, you know, we've had a vote. I struggle with this. I, I feel for everybody here, the dankers, especially the way I'm voting, but, and I don't blame them. I just, I don't think we're setting the right precedent here. I just don't know that this is what, how it's supposed to be. And I understand there's other situations that have occurred, but in a fire rebuild, we should find a way. And I don't know that moving the second story situation elsewhere is the answer. That's where I'm struggling. And it, nothing to do with them. They're beautiful people, great property, but I just struggle with that. If I remove myself from everyone I know with creating that situation. So I don't have a better answer right now. Is there I'm willing, to, I'm willing to revisit it, but I'm not willing to, I, I just, I don't want to set this precedent, which I think is exactly what's happening. What and, do you think uh, is the precedent? When a fire rebuild goes in, if the second story is here, moving it over here, I just don't, I don't think that's, the neighbors could, anyone could anticipate that. You know, I just think it's, it's changing the idea, I think it becomes probably closer to a CDP instead of a fire rebuild. But for the fire, but for the fire, the Clunis Ross wouldn't have a view through that area, even from their second story, mm, I which we that. all know is not protected. Yeah, I don't know that to be true. You, I mean, you don't know, you don't believe the tree pictures? I don't have any pictures that can show that situation. I know there was a lot of uh, plants and trees on the Danker property, absolutely. But they purposely, when you at the Clooney Ross house, they purposely situated it to go towards a view and avoid the Danker's house. That's very obvious. They did not point and try and go over the Danker's house. They pointed to the side of it. And yet it's still pointed right at the Danker's house. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's to the left of it. So that's what I struggle with. I'm I, I'm fine with the Danker's house. I'm fine with all that. I just I just struggle with that. We have changed that situation. That that's where I'm that's where I'm stuck right now. Is there a particular finding that you're having trouble making, and any adjustment to the project that would allow you to? Uh, make that finding? Absolutely. I want the Dankers to build their house desperately, but I, that second story situation moving, I think is. So you want to take away their right to have any second story? No, I would, I would grant them a variance to have the second story back where it was. I don't see the issue with that in this case. It's a fire. And then rebuild. we get appealed to the planning commission who would say, we've got a hard and fast rule of no third story. Or we could force them to dig further underground to put the the garage all the way underground and have a situation where water drains into it. Well, we all know that you can waterproof garages. So, um, I mean, I hear your points. I'm not saying you're wrong. And I don't want to belabor this into the night, but it's very late. I get it. But that's the situation I'm concerned with. I'm sorry that it's causing inconvenience, but... 
Is it the site plan review findings that you're having trouble making for the second story? Yes, I guess I think so. I don't have the language right in front of me, but yes. Would it be helpful to speak to the, the to speak to the Dankers to see if they would consider an adjustment, or if there is an adjustment? to be made that would allow you to make the findings required? Give me a sec. You know, the way that second story sat on the property before, kind of at an angle, the barrier was about the same size, I would guess, looking at these plans of the original house. What page are you looking at? I'm looking at uh, sheet, the, the large plans, right. sheet A0.10 and right. sheet A0.11. So if it was that, you know, it's the, the two points go across the view instead of the two flat sides. Show me which one you're looking at. There's a lot of different little diagrams here. A0.10 has an aerial view of uh, it in the lower right-hand corner. Okay. My understanding is we're talking about the uh, that square that's uh, Top. For this to the west, is that correct? Richard? Oh, okay. All right, I'm trying to follow as well. <laughs> so on ten, the square on the on the west side there is that correct? Yeah, there's a, there's a square on the on the yes on the west side that's it's over a, closest to the driveway. Yes, the two story area. That's correct. And it's sitting so to maximize its width relative to the Clooney's Ross house. Is that correct? Uh, the way it's oriented, well, you're right, because of the way it's turned on an angle, it would appear wider. Right. So the apparent wideness is probably about the same. Right, it's just moved to the other side of the house. I get that. I mean, like I said, I don't blame the Dankers. I think they've done what they yeah. think they should done, what they should do. Um, I mean, I'm I mean, more only than willing to spend some time and, and try and talk about this more. I, I don't want to delay it. It's been I can't even imagine how long, over two years already. I don't want to deny this project, but I am I am uncomfortable with basically flipping the second story condition. We're, we're in a situation now where we, we now have 20 completed homes, 20. I'm, I'm well aware of that. Yeah. I, have, I have fought for our fire rebuild. I brought up doing the waivers. I'm all, I'm all in. Yeah. I'm all in. I go to a lot of the properties. I just, I'm, I'm not mad at the Dankers at all. I think the Dankers are great. I'm worried about this condition with another 20 homes in, like you said, another potentially 400 plus coming. Well, you, you've already given permits out to 168 of them. Right. I got that. I got that. So there's maybe another 220, maybe. <laughs> or a so. small number. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let's, we got to move this along. So let's, I'm willing to continue it to, to, and I'll meet with the Dankers. I'll meet with planning to see if there's anything we can do. I'm just, I'm, I'm nothing, I have nothing against the Danker house at all. Zero. 
I'm just worried about this condition where we're moving the second story again. So we can keep talking about it, but I'm still worried about that condition. Is that a motion to continue this item to uh, the following meeting? Yes. Now let's see if we can come up with something and I'll dedicate the time to it. Okay. I'll put that on me. Together. February 8th, that agenda goes out this week. Yes, right. I'm going Put to. it on. What did you say, Richard? Well, I was just going to say that I'm a little concerned if the, if the plan is to meet and come up with an alternative design, uh, the Dinkers may not have time uh, to be able to to get that drawn up in time for the packet to be produced. I get that, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to delay this project, but I'm. They maybe, also may be able to convince Mikey that they really have exhausted their remedies. Anything else they do is going to shove the property over further. I'll tell you what, here, towards here, the neighbors. Here's here's my plan. Once again, I think communication has been a big thing. So I'll put myself in the middle. Maybe we can meet with the Clooney Rosses and the Dankers. I know probably are not in great terms, but well, let's all as neighbors meet there and see what we can come up with. I'll meet there this weekend. I'm glad to put the time in. So you're still wanting it to continue to the eighth? Yes, please. And I hope you guys agree or else, you know, I don't want to deny the project. I think there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, I agree. About redesigning a project. Um, I, I just have to say for the record also, we all hear a lot of complaints about the staff and why does everything take so long? This is not the staff. I. Hey, I get it. I get it. I'm all for moving things ahead quickly. I just, I am struggling with this situation here. I'm struggling with that we moved the second story to a different part of the house. Um, I, I appreciate that, but but let's just be honest here. This is taking, this is just going on and on and on because of us, not because of the staff. Well, that, that's fair. This, this is the only meeting we've heard this at. It's not like we've had multiple meetings. It's the only one. So. I'm referring to lots of things, not this one in particular. And I agree. I agree. The, the complaints about short-term rental, the complaints, you know, all kinds of things that go on for years. In many cases, it boils down to the council. I would say in almost every case. I'd, I'd love to be part of the solution. And you know what? Being the solution means making hard decisions. <laughs> you don't That's think why this we is get hard? the big bucks. <laughs> no, this is hard. I don't want I don't want to be here to, saying I'm not comfortable with this, but that's where I'm at. I'm being honest. I'm not trying to delay anything. And I know I am, but I would like one more chance to look at this then, or else my vote still remains no. So I hope you'll give it to me to try and, and go through this and figure this out. Because I'm, okay. you know, I'd like to talk with Richard and see if we can figure it out. But just, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with moving that second story. Okay, so do we need a new motion? Yeah, we need a motion to, to uh, continue this to the next council meeting, which I think was February 8th. Okay, I'll uh, I'll make that motion. If I can get a second. Seconded. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Corsanti. Yes. And Councilmember Fair. Yes, and I'm sorry. And I'm sorry too. I really am. Um, to everyone involved in that situation, I think it's horrible. Okay. Well, it's midnight again. Do you want to take a quick break to get other council members back? Well, I, I don't know how much longer can we try and do. I mean, I would agree to do 7A, but then I think we're done. I mean, it's late. 7A and B, I guess. But I mean, we just can't go all night. This is ridiculous. Okay. We should give the other counselors a chance to get back into the meeting. They've of course. 
Do you want to take a, a short break to get, get them back in? Uh, yeah, three minutes, could we? Yeah, just quick, because it's late. Okay. Back at 11.57. Okay, thank you. They're going to turn off their microphone and their, uh, their visual. Council member Uring, the uh, council took a three minute break. They'll be back on shortly. Okay, folks, if you can hear me. There's Bruce. Got everyone's spread all over the place. Okay, there we go. All right. I wish I could have shared that nap with you guys. <laughs> well, I ain't gonna wait until they get back here, but here comes Paul. Okay, we're back. We're on 7A, and I don't think we'll get much further. I guess 7B we could do too if we can get through 7A. Because, um, yes, Bruce. So I would like to make a motion to adjourn and get to these early next meeting, or I'm sorry, to continue this meeting. As Steve, or, as Steve had suggested earlier this evening, this is not going to be a quick decision I don't believe and I and I have an objection and I do not want to cause people to have to go to one in the morning by raising it and it's something I've gone back and forth with John about so you know we, we tried to resolve it and it's a serious problem and um, 
I just I, my, my proposal is that my proposal it yes it affects 7a and my proposal is that we um, continue this meeting to another date that is before two weeks from now and finish this meeting Marky yes Steve I spoke to Reva this morning on this issue and continuing it. And that and had a conversation with John. We can continue this meeting up to five days from today, as long as we don't change anything on the agenda. All right, we don't add anything. John, is that correct? I'm hearing that's correct. Okay. So, I mean, my suggestion would be let, let Reva, you know, go, she's got to get staff. Let her go back and take a look at what days are available. She can get back to us. Let's pick a day and continue it and do it right. Cause some, you're right. It's, it's 12 o'clock, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Paul? Is there any chance we could start the meeting earlier than 6.30? Hmm. I think that Terry Lukoff's point was well taken. And I think that we'd all do a lot better if we could start it. You know, I don't know what anybody's time demands are, but if, if we could start it even at five, that would be a huge help. If we could start it at 3.30, I could make that work. Okay. Mikey, your times are probably more tight as, any, as anybody here, so. Yeah, I mean, I can I can arrange to start at five. That, five five that works goes. for me. Okay. Bruce? Yeah, I, I, I concur with that. I, I know that over the years, when meetings were started early, were noticed to start at three, four, or five, some residents have complained that that was intended to prevent them from being able to participate. I've never viewed it that way. Um, I actually view it as an accommodation to the public and, and to, in order to be able to get the meeting actually accomplished while people are awake and paying attention. So I would favor any earlier start time. I'm going to agree with Bruce and we've already had public <laughs> Look how far comment. we've come already after I meeting. Reckon, yeah. We've already had public comment and all the other stuff that people want to talk about the budget and all the rest of that stuff. So got, we don't, we don't, we're not, we, when we, if we do this, we don't have public comment. Right. Only on the issues that are on the agenda that haven't yet been addressed. No general, general public, no 2A. 2A is gone. Um, I will, I, let's, I, Reva, Reva, do you have any you? comments on this? Reva, you have any, you've got to do some work to set another date. Is that achievable? Absolutely. I know tomorrow night is not available because we're hosting the uh, Civic Center Water Treatment Facility uh, public meeting, um, but I don't believe there's any commission meetings the, the rest of the week, so I can certainly um, okay. clearly make sure we have staff available. Um, so I just uh, need to know which items specifically you wanted to continue so that we have those for the record. I would make a motion. We continue this meeting to a date that Reba identifies over the next day or so that works for her. We start the meeting at five o'clock and we continue with item 7A, move forward. We do not add anything new to the agenda. Of course, okay. Right. Um, nor, take, nor take anything off. Nor take anything off. Literally John, that, moving forward. Right, is that okay with you, John? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, can I get a second to that motion? Are we gonna get a date? I date. Reba's gonna pick one. I mean, I think if we're you, if thinking there's Wednesday anything, or Friday or Thursday or Friday, right? Right. There's a date that doesn't work. I guess you can share that with me now. Um, I just need to double check that we have all of our available staff uh, to, to hold the meeting. I would say it's probably makes more sense Thursday instead of Friday, just because you know I don't know if staff and people have plans. Yeah. Yeah, Thursday would doesn't really there. matter to me. I'll be sitting in the same chair for the next year. I would think Wednesday or Thursday, if you can hit those dates for you, that'd be good. I'm completely open. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. Thursday, I think, is the best date that I see. Okay. Thursday's good for me. Yeah, I can make it. Okay. All right. We got a motion. Do we have a second? Uh, Mayor Pearson, I, I, I don't want to throw any wrinkles in anything because I, I understand that's a good plan. Um, but I do just want to remind you that I still do not have an administration and finance subcommittee. And so uh, we'll be unable to bring the major budget forward at the next meeting um, because we won't have time to unless we release it after the agenda is posted. So just uh, bringing Are that forward see? for you. If we, have, if, if we put it in an administrative and finance committee at the next meeting, can we call that 
group together on Friday to get your budget issue taken care of? to have at least a 24-hour notice for the administration and finance meeting, so I wouldn't be able to do that in time from so Thursday why, night why, and Friday. Why don't, but then why don't you just do the 24-hour notice? We'll make it, we'll vote for the administrative and finance committee at the next, at the Thursday meeting, and we can have the, the group can meet on Friday. Does that not work? Um, I still think it won't work in terms of putting out the agenda for the, for the next meeting. So um, okay. just, I'm just I'm I appreciate the flexibility. I just want everyone to know that the budget, uh, mid-year budget will be moved until the second meeting in February. Okay, I'm trying. Thank Thank Paul, Paul. Can, can I make a motion? Can I ask for a friendly amendment that we decide on the administration and finance subcommittee right now and and then delay the rest of it till Thursday? Would that work for you, Reva? Okay, uh, Bruce? If that's okay with the council, that would definitely work so we could move that item. Will you forward. accept the friendly amendment? Sure. Absolutely, I was gonna suggest it myself. Okay, absolutely. Okay. So should we do roll call on that, then get to... And, to be, and, and Mayor Pearson, to be clear, the motion is to adjourn after we take other actions, to adjourn to 5 p.m. on Thursday. Is that correct? Right. Right. Thank correct. You. John, John is, is it technically an adjournment or is it a continuance? A continuance, right? Continuance. Well, then technically you're adjourning to a date, specific date and time, and because it's within five days, no further noticing is required, provided you don't add okay. new items. Um, John, I, I just want to make sure that everyone's understand that I still need to double check on the availability of our staff to be able to host the meeting. I'm sure it'll be fine. They're usually pretty flexible, but I, I just want to have that moment tomorrow morning to double check with everything. Great. Cool. That's fine, but we, we we might need to pick a new date at that point in time, and then we'd have to work the council to that. So just wanted to be clear. Understood. We know this is complicated. Okay, so we have a motion. Did did we get a second? I think they accepted the mo the did the second accept as well? Yes, we accepted okay. the amendment. So, so let's have a roll call and we'll finish up. Who was the second? I know Steve made the motion, but <clears throat> who actually seconded the motion? And I guess I was the second. I thought I it was my motion. First but... was. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Hearing? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, we're on to item 7A, um, just the first item, appointment to the ANF subcommittee. How do we do this, Mikey? Well, um, it's a fantastic question. I remember it well at my last, last time I went through it, pretty much just sat here and got run over. But other than that, it was great. Um, so, Paul? Can I make a motion that the administration and finance subcommittee be Mikey and Steve? I'll okay. second that. We got Mikey. I mean, I don't have a problem. We got Mikey on a lot of committees. How do we have me on there? We haven't voted on him yet. <laughs> we don't have any on there. <laughs> oh, I thought, okay. I thought you'd stay on the committees you were already on. No? Maybe, oh, maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Yeah, I don't know. I love a municipal, I love a municipal government. <laughs> Local government's great, isn't it? Uh, Bruce? Okay, so um, I may just be tilting at windmills, but I will say that I, I would like to be on this committee. And the reason that I believe I ought to be on this committee is twofold. One, uh, I was on the management committee for many years of a law firm which had a budget greater than the city of Malibu. And this is exactly the type of thing that we did on an annual basis. And I believe that I have the experience to serve on this committee. Secondly, to the extent that we are gonna continue with the current staff in Toto, which remains to be seen, since everybody wants me to have an opportunity to meet and learn about and get along with, among others, the city manager, and since that will be a meeting setting, not a personal one-on-one, -on -one, which I do continue to require to be recorded for obvious reasons at this point, um, I think this will be a great opportunity for that to be occurring. So that's my proposal. 
Um, and I know that it requires three people other than myself to agree with, or two people. Mikey, can, I, can I say something? I guess, Steve. Okay. I don't know about you guys. I think we made some strides this meeting. I think Bruce's comments under the, the council member comments in the beginning was right on track. It's, it's, I think he recognized that we've got to make this thing work and we've got to get better at it. Uh, and Bruce was the big vote getter. So I would, and, and I know, I know that hurts, but you know, that's, uh, no, I'm just laughing because I mean, last time when uh, this came up, I wanted to be on a and something fierce. Did you? And oh, I have a financial background like you do. Um, and but nope, didn't happen. So I mean, it's uh, my experience on committees is you know, it is what it is, it doesn't necessarily relate to this at all, but it, you know, got hey, a couple look. things, didn't get you know, so I know how you look at it. So I mean, you know, I've got, again, I've got an accounting background, so I, you know, I, but if, 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 if Bruce liked to be on that, and Mikey, you're okay with that, I'll, I'll back off and let you two guys take it. Well, I mean, we have, yes, Paul. Steve, I, I, I'm, I may be mistakenly, but I'm under the impression you have the strongest accounting background of any of the five of us. Is that correct? Uh, depending on how you, I've got a strong accounting background. Yes. I got a strong financial background. Who's got the second strongest? I don't know. You know, we're not going to have a, a, a math know, just, quiz, but, uh, you know, so, you can speak, Bruce. Okay. So uh, what I will say is um, I, I don't have an accounting background. No, 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 don't make any pretension to have an accounting background. Uh, what I do have, aside from the experience of being on a, in, in a business that had a budget larger than we do as a city, um, I have an expertise in litigation of valuation issues and, and financial issues, even though I know have no legal, no educational background in accounting, I have a extensive background in having to learn those things in the work in the working world for purposes of the litigation that involved those kinds of issues, including SEC filings, which are all about Number accounting. Three. Accounting. The other thing I will say is my law firm, when we had the financial crisis in 2008, we um, made a deliberate decision as partners that we were not going to lay off any staff, even if it meant getting less profit for partners. And, and we did, we made less money. But we also went through a concerted review of every single penny we were spending to make sure that we were not overspending anywhere. And it was, it was painstaking and you would not believe the kinds of things we found where there was waste and we ended up shaving off one to two million dollars from our annual expenditures by doing that and that's the kind of thing i think we as a city need to be doing and it's one of the things i did run on and that's why i would like to be on this committee to be able to apply that kind of analysis and and that's also part of the transparency that i've been asking for and accountability so i i, I do have a lot of experience in this area it's just not traditional accounting experience Right. Well, it still comes down to a vote. I mean, I hear you. Um, there was a motion and it was seconded, but Steve, you're withdrawing. Is that what you're saying? Uh, Bruce, how, you really want this? I mean, no, me, I, really I, would don't. Think, I would I would think Bruce would be, I can think of another committee that makes more sense to me with his skills, but that's maybe just me and we're not talking about other ones now. So, well, we're, we, we're all going to be on two or three committees, obviously. Yeah. Should and, we vote for the members one at a time? Yeah, and just let me, if somewhere down the road we want to change the members of the committee, that's an achievable objective, right? Absolutely. Okay, fine. So what's that mean, fine? I'm in. Okay, so we have a motion. 
for Steve and I. And uh, let, can we have roll call, please? And Steve, did you second that motion? I uh, think I, I did. Will. Or somebody, I let somebody else second. Yeah, I, I seconded it a while ago. I should okay. have been sticking my own motions. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Garcanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? I would like to pass for a moment. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. And Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carried. I, I, I vote yes. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Um, so let me know. Let us know when the meeting is. Okay. Now we're going to vote for the uh, for the other. Did we already no. vote to adjourn? No, we said we said we're only going to no. do this when we're going home. Motion to adjourn. No, it's not okay. adjourning. It's uh, a motion to continue. Continue. Okay. We have a second from Steve. I'll second. Uh, yes. Roll call, please. I, I think we already we already did this through the through the last vote. Did we not? We voted to continue. I was just making official that we're done. I don't know. Maybe we don't need to. John, do we need to? Heather, just to confirm, they've already voted on the motion to adjourn to Thursday at 5 p.m. Is that correct? That is correct. And Mikey, you can adjourn the meeting on your own. You don't need a motion. All by myself, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for their hard night, work. Thank and you I'm sorry much. for another late night. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. 45 minutes quicker than last time. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. night.